the mm -hmm. question in there is just that's where we would want to go to in sort of the next stage of, of looking at return on investment because if you can demonstrate that you can actually do that then I think that's when we might sit up and say maybe we need to put more money into this maybe this is something that we need to you know um, take your uh, budget and go up by uh, uh, give you 25% more which would make it 1.25% <laughs> of the total budget Trustee McDonald thank you just to go back to the math for a second, um, and I want to tie it in because I think this is perhaps, and, and uh, I'm not going to ask a question because then I'll lose a chance to, to come back to my real question. I'm going to assume that this was uh, uh, this was your, your uh, you know um, a sample of prototyping. So we we identified a problem because we are having lacking results in in uh, real math, and the the outcome is to make sure that we have those improvements. So as you've said, you you know this is the first first piece out of the mm -hmm. uh, out of it and I recall having the conversation that it was longitudinal it was going to be there um, and these were this was done with grade six students and I would assume then that we would see some improvements for potentially next year in EPO because it was done with those and, and as we move forward we should see those incremental uh, increases that you're showing here from the beginning of the year to the to the um, to the end of that school year so from a prototype standpoint you know, I think you've got enough evidence to show that, that um, success is moving forward. You, you anticipated where you were going to get. True success is determined, uh, I guess, is make sure we're solving the problem. But you talked, at one point you said, and, and maybe it was, I, I took it out of context, you said this is a million dollars um, for this. Hmm. Last year when I looked at the budget, we anticipated that this was going to cost $90,000. Inquired, uh, inquired, I think, what did you say it was? In, Inquiry-based math, I think it was the, the project that we had. So, if it costs a million dollars, really on budget, or is it not really a million bucks? Yeah, go ahead, director. When I presented the math report, the ask from the board was for an additional three hundred fifty thousand. Um, the uh, number that you see there um, is comprised of a couple things: uh, that plus a contribution of our discretionary program budget on top of that. As well, through our partnership in USDN, uh, we secured over $100,000 from that. So that's not unlike how we do our work, is that we pull our budget resources together um, in sufficient quantity to try and generate an impact. Um, so uh, we're not over budget in that sense. In terms of the ask, we're within uh, that portion, but um, it was made up of more than just that one piece. That was just the ask at that point in time. Um, So you did get a question in. I didn't want to ask too many. <laughs> you actually asked multiple questions. Asking a question, trustees, and getting a nod confirming is, in fact, a, a question. So be careful. I am on you. Can you start? McCray. Yeah, and I'll come to you next, uh, Trustee Swan. Trustee McRae? So my question is through the chair to the chair. When we look at um, our total budget of three million to uh, three million two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, and then sorry three hundred and twenty five million dollars, and then we look at our proposed program budget, and we're looking at program <coughs> being only one percent of our entire budget, and to me that that doesn't seem right. Uh, especially when something that's as important as program, uh, to me that that could be more. And I I support that with the notion that <coughs> if we in fact spent close to a million dollars on the math in order to move it forward, and that was just one particular area of math, I believe um, associate director called it linear. Is that what you called it? Linear? Go ahead. If I may, linear patterning and algebra. Okay. Um, and if we want to be self-sustaining and with no guarantees of what our um, new political party is going to give us in that envelope of money, shouldn't we be putting more money into our proposed program budget? That's not uh, for me to, to say yes or no to. I think that that's 
but that's part of the uh, discussion. I, th I think that it's, you know, we compartmentalize the program budget um, and perhaps uh, somebody else can talk to this more than I can, but that supports the programming that goes on in the schools, right? So I think that, so what is, what is the program budget? Is that the manipulatives that are used in a class to support the mathematics learning? Is, is that program? Is it program um, for the professional development that might come out of a school budget? So I think that we don't want to lose sight of the fact that there are probably in many in other lines um, numbers that contribute to the overall support of the programs that support our kids, including special education, which is a huge component of 25, 26 million. So I think we have to keep that in mind too. If that's on top of this, the special education amount. So associate director, do you? Okay. So, so is it fair to say then that one percent really isn't a complete picture in terms mm -hmm. of this pie, and this three million six hundred fifty nine million is is uh, it is a truly is it a true picture? I think it's, well, and you can speak to what your budget's about, but if I understand what your budget is about, it's in supporting new directions. It's supporting uh, systemic systemic change. Um, but why don't you speak to it since I'm not sure why I'm trying to answer your question. True, you, you're doing very well. I appreciate the uh, emotional stability it's bringing, but. Uh, uh, I think you're quite right, and, and special education is the same way. Those are incremental uh, funding pieces that are over and above uh, the money that's given to support student learning. So first and foremost, um, teacher salaries, um, the spaces in which our students are congregated to learn, uh, the leadership of the principal, the school budget that um, supplies many of the, the resources. So that's sort of the, that's the baseline kind of operation for a program. This is really designed to uh, respond to challenges and to uh, provide opportunities to improve our effectiveness. Um, I w I'm not going to argue against more money for a uh, program ever, uh, but I think it is it is fair to acknowledge that there are other contributors. Uh, again, um, it's a larger amount, I believe, in special education than, than uh, what was quoted. It's rather uh, quite significant. And again, it's meant to be incremental funding over and above uh, that very large piece of the pie that I think uh, uh, Superintendent Coons will be uh, speaking to later, which really is that, that big yellow chunk that was on Nancy's uh, diagram that you saw earlier. So your budget, where does it, where does uh, your budget come from out of the GSNs? Does it come out of the admin line or does it come out of um, probably a multiple line? Mo it, that's the, it, it really is uh, quite a dog's breakfast in terms of funding sources. Um, there's some through, through the People Foundation grant. There are lines for coordinators, consultants. That's where some of our staff comes from. Uh, lots of initiatives will bring with it their own money. There's money in the French language grant. There's money uh, that comes from ELL. So really, the program budget is uh, an amalgamation of a number of funding sources, and not just the GSN. Lots of those EPO special purpose grants will fall into that program category. So it's a rather dynamic um, pool of resources to manage. Mm -hmm. Trustee McRae, and then I'm going to move on. So, um, oh, sorry, I have Trustee Swan, sorry. I'm going to go to Trustee Swan first. Trustee Swan? Uh, first, I have a question for you, Chair. Sure. Well, I, I just like a definition because I've never heard the term before, and then I may have a question. Okay. You referred to turnaround schools. What does that mean? Somebody else can answer that that actually can. Um, so we want to talk about turnaround schools? Associate Director? So turnaround schools uh, were um, a literacy and numeracy uh, secretariat initiative to identify uh, schools that had, through their data, showing um, a history of underperformance. And it was designed to be um, an injection of uh, resources and uh, some expertise um, for uh, a period of time. Uh, and the challenge was, um, again, there were often um, effects that were generated uh, while those additional resources were present and then uh, the effects started to diminish once those resources were uh, taken away. So that really I think the lesson learned is to look at other ways of trying to sustain the quality other than 
um, just putting large influx of, of stuff in. Um, one of the things that, just to make a connection, if I may, to the model that we tried to do is rather than um, have something that was um, unassailable uh, after a program left, we had sort of a graduated release model. So teachers would come together with a facilitator for a session. Um, that's a, that's an, an expensive proposition. But then there would be a follow-up in a day or two in their school, smaller groups of teachers, still with a facilitator, and then um, minimal resources so that they could get together and do the work for themselves. So it was really the idea that after one of these units that you would be able to sustain that work on your own without the facilitator, uh, without an extensive application of additional resources for professional learning. So trying to apply some of the caution um, gleaned from that, that turnaround work earlier. And that program was almost entirely run by the ministry, right? Like it wasn't. That's correct. So they, came, they, they identified came. the schools? Yes. They funded it? They pretty well ran the whole program. Well, hey, Trustee Spahn, do you have a question? My last question is, we, do we still get funding for that or no? Okay. There is um, funding that, uh, I guess in name, would come from that, but the method by which we use it is quite different. So uh, rather than picking just one special school, um, that's money that's gone into the program pot to help all of our schools. Uh, we don't overload a school with some extraordinary set of resources that could not be sustained or um, allocated equitably to all of our schools. So we've taken that pot and we've tried to distribute it equitably rather than um, having one school a winner and the next door neighbor maybe not so fortunate. Okay, Trustee McCray, and then we'll move on to our, our next presentation. So the uh, 2014-15 proposed program budget um, that we are presently proposing, uh, will there be enough money in that, uh, Associate Director, um, to ensure the sustainability of this, mas if, uh, of this mathematics uh, initiative and other focuses in mathematics if we need to do that? If I may, I, I wouldn't anticipate that um, there would be an increase or the, in the scale or scope um, that will have a similar resource pot to try and um, approach it. So we're looking at roughly the same number of teachers uh, and the same number of hours of training as a maximum. Um, so we can't go bigger. We can do kind of the same level of effect um, either in the same place or somewhere else or with a different curriculum focus. Can we look at other areas of mathematics besides linear? Go ahead. If we need to. Okay. And I think the answer is yes, and that's one of the uh, utilities of having EQAO. When we get those results, that would be, we would again pull it apart, do an analysis, and look at, you know, where does that data point to where we have areas of greatest student need in the area of mathematics. This was the area that, through the EQAO analysis, was the question that the kids did least well on, correct? Yes. The area. <coughs> if I can, if I may. Yeah. The other, the other part about this particular curriculum area is it wasn't just that students were struggling in grade six math. We felt that the expectations that are, um, are gained through linear patterning and algebra really become gateway uh, learnings for students to go on in mathematics when they get to high school. So students who are struggling to do these math questions in grade six end their math journey at the end of grade 10. Uh, and that's really quite unfortunate. It eliminates a huge spectrum of future careers. Uh, it puts graduation at risk. There are all kinds of consequences for not being able to do this. We really felt that this was an essential area um, to really focus our, our effort. But there may be others revealed in our, in our data and in the larger body of research as well. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Associate Director, for the budget report on your program department. And you will be um, doing the Director's Office report on behalf of uh, Director Thomas. So go for it. If I may. Uh, I, do have, uh, I do have some remarks that Director Thomas uh, asked me to share with you tonight. So. 
Um, if you'll indulge my, uh, my reading. Um, Dr. Thomas has said he understands that this is the work of the senior officers of the board, but this is our uh, district's 11th straight year compliant and balanced ministry education approved budgets. In a year when we advanced full day kindergarten ahead by one whole year, we knew this would be a challenge to manage our comprehensive and complicated budget work. Our budget cultivates confidence and support in the Upper Canada District School Board. The budget is focused on students, student achievement, student mental health, and student physical health and nutrition. As I've said to you in the past, our auditors have stated we can almost account for every hot dog sold. We are listening to our trustees, our various stakeholders, our parents, our students. The senior team understands how important linking the budget to our strategic plan is in the accountability framework. We're becoming more comfortable with this dynamic and evolving process. The staff is embracing the KPI care art process and duties associated with the accountability framework. We, the senior team, believe this alignment will bring greater transparency, integrity, and accountability. This budget supports the aspiration of our trustees. It aligns the teachers to their work and connects students to their dreams. We continue to believe the budget supports the powerful action and strategies of the board's strategic plan. This budget is about educating the heart and the head. It's all about character over convenience, perseverance over quitting, showing integrity always, and it will always be about putting our students first. <laughs> this is also the budgeting foundation for systematic changes that will occur next year through the 2020-21 Next Level Driven Leadership Focus. We are rearranging our families of schools and empowering our schools to accept full accountability for the student-focused direction of the board. This budget is the first of more to come that will support this new systemic structure. The director has uh, offered his report to you in narrative form. Uh, as you can see, it is quite comprehensive, uh, hoping that um, it can stand as the major source of information. Uh, he has asked, however, that, um, that uh, Phil Dawes uh, highlight for you the uh, work on communications, if, that's, uh, if you're okay to go with that, Phil. Uh, also at the back of the room, you'll see that there are a number of director's office staff here uh, to assist in any questions you may have arising from his report. Okay, before we go there, do you want to do the legal piece or? Sure. Really, just in terms of the narrative report, I draw your attention to page 36 in his narrative report. Uh, and in that, you'll see uh, a summary of the director's office legal fees, uh, both the actual and budgeted. And you'll see a breakdown by labor-related budget charges, general board matters, and facilities in uh, construction, as well as this particular uh, one-time charge for the OLRB um, hearing. At this point in time, there has been a a contingency budget of two hundred ninety thousand um, dollars put aside for uh, legal fees. Okay. Any questions about that? We can come back to that, um, Mr. Dawes. Thank you, Chair. Um, there is a PowerPoint for this part of the. Oh, there it is. Thank you. So um, thank you, Chair, and as Associate Director indicated, this is specific to the uh, communications and relationship management component of the uh, Director's Office budget. Uh, communications and relationships management, we're commonly referring to now as the CRM department, and it's my pleasure to give you an overview of uh, that budgetary component of the uh, Director's Office. Uh, we've laid this out in a similar manner to the other components of the uh, Director's Office budget with an overview related to uh, scope, operating context, return on investment, the actual budget, and uh, next steps, challenges, and risks. Uh, with respect to scope, I thought a good way to present this would be uh, in the context of the mission of the Communications CRM Department as a whole, which is uh, strategic and innovative communications for all. And uh, this, really the scope of that work is uh, contained within these bullet points. An overall effort to uh, build general communication support, to build strong relationships with local media, to develop a communication technique for crisis management, training in social media and website management, promoting and branding schools and the UCDSB as a whole, and advertising, video production, and broadcasting. 
With respect to uh, operating context, I wanted to make reference to uh, Crew Charter C49, which was presented to the Board of Trustees in September 2012. Uh, coming out of that particular Crew Charter was an action plan, which trustees have been uh, notified as it proceeds. And my understanding is there will be a comprehensive uh, presentation of the CRM department on the progress of that action plan uh, next fall. Nonetheless, within the context of the action plan, it really helps to drive the specific workflow of the department under these key areas. Uh, relationship and uh, relationship management, which is really about developing a strong organizational culture with engaged staff that understand their role in addressing student needs and the objectives of the board. Uh, crisis management, really um, this is an area of CRM de department growth that's uh, still in its earliest stages of development. Uh, to date, the departmental focus in this area has been limited to identifying professional development needs and aligning the communication function of crisis management with existing critical response roles, tools, and procedures. Uh, promotions and branding. Our board is becoming increasingly aware of the role that service excellence plays in the promotion of and branding of our schools, and we're starting to integrate that flow of thought much more directly into the uh, context of CRM department. Uh, fiscal management. The CRM department is operating within its assigned and reduced budget, and furthermore, additional savings are being sought through investment strategies that promote newer and more effective approaches for improved results. And item five, building capacity, uh, support in the form of training to school office staff in social media website maintenance has been a major shift in priority focus. Uh, CRM staff is also receiving professional development in social media and general global communication strategies and to maintain the department's focus of supporting school needs. So that really was the context of the uh, work that was undertaken this year. Uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to speak a bit about the return on investment of the work that was under, undertaken in the 2013-14 uh, school year. Um, certainly what we're seeing is um, a marked uh, increase in overall social media use within our schools. All of our schools now uh, are seeing an increase in followers on their uh, Facebook pages. Uh, social media use by schools is monitored now on a daily basis by the CRM department. Live video coverage of sporting events has been a, a major focus this year with uh, some really outstanding results, I might add. 82% of our high schools are promoting uh, their schools through a video. Uh, very pleased in uh, the assistance we're getting from students in video production through CRM assistance. 20,000 views of UCDSB videos this past year, a 51% increase in Facebook followers this past year alone, and 3,158 Twitter followers, which is more than double from last year. A few words then about the budget itself. Uh, what we're looking at for 2014-15 as a whole is uh, not uh, really a change from this current year. Uh, within the uh, department itself, what we're seeing is a, a higher indication on the salary end from last year uh, to account for some um, staffing changes that have happened, uh, transitioning between um, the director's office directly and the CRM department and the addition of a videographer. Um, yeah, I'll leave that at the tolls. Next steps, challenges, and risks. We really are um, in, in an era of change globally, as, as trustees are aware, on, on the communication front. And uh, our department wants to maintain its relevance and focus on maintaining knowledge and understanding of those trends. Uh, we want to continue to be um, of support uh, to schools through training. We want to continue to focus on staff growth and development to keep abreast of uh, trends. We're considering entertaining the um, assistance of some marketing services so that we could get a, a clear understanding of the impact that our work is having across the system with a view to global communication strategies. Uh, we want to build a stronger relationship with our local media so that they can uh, anticipate uh, the information that we're sharing with them and, and uh, we can get a better response uh, that's uh, effective to the board overall. And uh, quite frankly, we want to keep up with demand. Um, particularly in the area of video production and the responses we're getting from schools with uh, respect to live streaming. Uh, our success could be our challenge next year 
uh, in current, trying to keep abreast of uh, the demand that we anticipate from schools in that particular area. So we're excited about the work to come. Uh, we're on fo we're uh, within budget. We're on focus, and uh, we're looking forward to reporting back to you on our progress next fall with a specific report. Thank you. Mr. Parker. Uh, for you, Chair, um, do you know if you're on budget from last year? For you, Chair, yes, yes, we are. Second question? Yep, go ahead. Uh, who's for you, Chair, who's responsible for training and teaching staff on the use or re reference to our uh, BYOD policy? Has there been any con communication or any conversation about that policy or maybe? Through you, Chair, the uh, training that we're talking about with respect to CRM department is specific to the work that Cindy has been doing in helping uh, school staff with website maintenance and Facebook. Which has been great. I just wonder whose <coughs> who's job is it to worry about our teaching staff? Or is it the worry for each other? <laughs> it is to be. Um, it wasn't showing favoritism by allowing Trustee uh, Carpenter Two questions. Get your name up. Trustee would like to know. Oh, careful how I word this one now. Uh, <laughs> I've got saved up. Right. No. No, There's no uh, transfer. One through you, Chair. When I when I look at the, the um, social media, we're doing wonderful in terms of internal communication. In other words, we're communicating with our own people and telling our own people what we're doing and finding many different ways of communicating with our own people. What are we doing in the communication in terms of getting outside our own walls? Uh, I noticed the, the advertising budget was 100 and... I don't have it in front of me. Uh, 145,000. Okay, how does that compare to our advertising budgets in the past? And is that meeting the needs of attracting attention outside our own doors? Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, the overall advertising budget line is uh, pretty similar uh, to this year. Uh, where we're seeing, what we're seeing is the bulk of that advertising money is money that goes to support schools directly, primarily with uh, in the area of uh, kindergarten registration. A uh, very small proportion of that budget is applied to what I would call more traditional advertising. Uh, I think your point about reaching beyond the um, scope of, if, of the board as a whole is a good one. Uh, it's one that we need to, uh, I think, provide a little more focus on, and uh, that kind of drives to the idea we've got about perhaps getting some uh, marketing consulting service <coughs> help so that we can understand how to really develop a, an effective advertising campaign that aligns with global communication strategies overall. Trustee McDonald. Thank you. <coughs> I have a couple of questions. You say you're on budget. We have your 2014-15 budget here. Is that an increase over last year's budget? And if it is, what areas are the increase in? In compared to uh, through you, chair, and compared to 2013-14, budget was uh, 721-053. So we're looking at next year at 743, 451. So it's similar. Uh, we are on track with the 20 on on the 2013-14 budget. We're on track for that. Again, the shift that's happened internally on those budget lines again is between salaries and equipment capital. Our equipment capital uh, line this next year is is much much reduced from this current year, which um, really represented our purchase of uh, video equipment that's been used for our live streaming. <coughs> Go ahead, sir. Me. Trustee McRae first. So, in terms of the question that, um, through you, Chair, through, uh, in terms of the question that uh, Trustee McMillan asked, um, where is that reflected <coughs> in the budget? I guess what I'm talking about is, you know, in terms of getting communication out into our communities and um, sustainability and increasing our brand, um, how will we do that 
in terms of a re how will we measure that in terms of a return on our, on our investment? And with that being a need that uh, Trustee McMillan has brought forward, um, what line will that come out of and where will we get those monies? Through you, Chair. Uh, right now, our, our focus on that would be coming through the advertising budget and again in the, uh, in the training and support that we're providing to schools through website uh, and uh, social media use and development. Uh, I would see next year if we were able to retain the services of some marketing help, it would come through our uh, contractual services line and we would be able to apply some of those strategies again to the advertising budget and the uh, actual PD support that we're providing to schools, which is really just reflective of our salary line. So in terms of the part of the question that, that uh, Trustee McCray asked in terms of measuring, part of the measure is the net promoter score. Do you have any, so that, that would represent the, the KRI, do you have any KPIs that you're looking at to measure in year? Through you, Chair. Uh, you're seeing, um, with what we've provided in this budget, a, a sense of the indicators that we're looking at right now. We'll be able to give you some more information when we present in the fall, but I will admit to you that it's an area that we want to explore more deeply in so that we can get a clearer understanding of giving you the information that you need and that we need to understand whether we're making an impact or not. Somebody else? McDonald's? So uh, just to skip to another section, your slide um, on return on investment. You talked on return on investment, it seems to be a lot about uh, social media, um, video coverage, which again um, could be a part of social media. How do you how do you determine, what's the context on determining what return on investment is? Through you, Chair? I, I, I totally agree. I think this is a challenge that we're going to have to address in, in the year and the years to come. Right now, the, this is the scope of the information that we're trying to provide to you and to, to our own department to strategize about whether we're hitting our mark on, on communication strategies. But again, we would like to retain the help of a marketing expert with global context to see if there's any other indicator data that we could be considering in addition to what we've already provided to you here. I can appreciate that to some degree we we'll make sure we measure it, but for the most part, social media is free. So I don't, I have, you know, from a school board perspective, the investment is very minimal and we're trying to elaborate on the return on investment. So if we have a little investment, does that mean we're getting little return? Or what are we trying to achieve, I guess? How are we, what are we trying to measure? Simply stating that we're increasing our followers. Through you, Chair. I, I think it's fair to say the theory of action here is that if we're able to assist our schools to build, build more of a social media culture, that they'll be able to engage in more effective communication with their parents, with their students, with their wider community. We're starting to look now at advertising from a different perspective. We're starting to realize that we probably, from a branding point of view, aren't able to get uh, potential clients, if you will, to change their branding association just by virtue of an advertisement. So the function of the advertisement now, we're trying to align more with the, actually the idea of uh, service excellence. That is, if you can look at an advertisement that then gets you as a potential client to get to the appropriate site where you can get the information that you need, where you can be guided through a registration process, where you can now engage in a discussion with somebody else from, the, from that community, that's the information that you're probably going to need to identify with that particular brand and, and choose that brand. So we're starting to think about that kind of a shift in strategy as a way to demonstrating that we're getting a best bang for our dollar on, on uh, advertising and other strategies. So last year you um, made year, I don't know that it was part of the, it certainly wasn't part of the original budget presentation. You purchased um, a quantity of video equipment for high schools. And with the look to that that was going to um, help populate or provide us an opportunity to populate uh, material to Upper Canada TV. Has that, uh, has that come to fruition? Are, are we seeing um, content come back from the schools? Uh, yes, Chair. We, we have spent the bulk of that um, equipment and capital line money now on the video equipment. It's being used for the live streaming and the UCTS, UCTV production 
and you can start to see some of the response we're getting by virtue of uh, viewership and um, the reaction we're receiving from our school communities on UCD, UCTV live streaming. So our, uh, our capital and equipment uh, line for next year is only $12,500. <laughs> okay, anything else? Trustee McDonald? So last year we were presented with a three year communication plan. How are we doing based on that plan and does the budget support continuation of that plan? Through you, Chair. All right. I think we've made good progress this year. I think we're on track from the perspective of maintaining our bottom line on the budget. Uh, we've been able to provide to you some metrics that indicate an increase in social media use. We're acknowledging that uh, we need to find other ways to measure our impact in those particular areas. Uh, we're certainly hearing from our schools that they appreciate and value the uh, professional development and support that they've been given on developing their understanding and application of social media. Uh, we want to continue with that uh, line in, uh, of, of action in, in the, the next year and the year following that. And we'll be able to give you a full update on that strategy and its effects in the fall when we report as a part of the uh, budget update process. Through you, Chair? Uh, I'll come to you in just a second, Trustee McCray first, and then Trustee Swan. So uh, one of our goals is uh, number two is crisis management. And I just wanted to know in terms of return on investment, how are we doing in that area? Uh, through you, Chair, um, this is just in its beginning stages. Uh, I wouldn't want to alarm trustees that we're not satisfied that we're not able right now to respond in kind to crisis situations. That, that wouldn't be true. Uh, but what we are trying to develop through the communications department is a better knowledge and comfort level with responding to media requests and media action as it occurs on site when these types of events happen. It's an area of growth that we know we need to focus on. Uh, it's just in its early stages and it's going to be a, a priority focus for next year. Okay, Trustee Swan. Thank you. Through you, Chair. I'm just wondering, 19% of the budget is spent on advertising and I'm wondering if we'd be able to reduce that if we increase the amount in professional development um, to go on to what uh, Second Vice uh, McDonald said, if we can increase our social media presence, that's free. Through you, Chair, I, I, I think you make a great point. I think it's something that we have been looking into, and it's an area that we're going to, continue, going to continue to look into. I will point out, however, that the line advertising might be misinterpreted a little bit. The vast majority of that money is money that goes directly to schools to help them with their kindergarten registration campaign. So we're listening very strongly and closely to the uh, advice and comments and information we're hearing back from our local school communities on how they want to spend that money. So uh, I appreciate what you're saying. We're, we're trying to address that, but we're also listening closely to what our schools are telling us. And that listening occurs through the, do you have a question on the electronic form for red kindergarten registration and on the paper form in schools on how parents heard about the registration information, correct? Yes, Chair, that's one of our key sources of information on that. Okay, I'm going to move on. Thank you uh, very much. Um, Mr. Carswell um, has discovered an error. Yes. Me. Well, he'd like to explain the error. So, um, I think he needs some of this math PD. Three, that three, he looks three, 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 uh, during my budget presentation, Trustee McDonald asked a very direct question regarding uh, the budget figures that were presented, I believe it was on slide four um, for the 13-14 year. Um, the label is incorrect and the amount actually is reflecting the budgeted amount, not the forecasted in progress amount. So with your indulgence, I'll amend that label. My apologies for the uh, inaccuracy of my answer. Label the graphs carefully. Okay. Uh, do you have anything else that you want to move to, uh, Associate Director? Because right now I'm scheduled to go to special education. Okay. All right. So we'll move now to uh, special education. Uh, Superintendent Edwards, the floor is yours.
Thank you, Chair uh, Petersman. I'm pleased to present the student engagement budget. And I'd like to start first from a quote uh, from a book that I just uh, finished reading and tied in with a quote from uh, Trustee McDonald. Stephen uh, Frost in his book, The Inclusion Imperative, says, if you want to change the world, you should start first with your organization. And uh, Trustee McDonald, a few years back, challenged us to be by the board by which others are measured. I think we can be very proud of the work our principals and our staff have done, which captures both of these challenges. Um, and the significant uh, progress that our schools and our system has made towards the goal of inclusion and our vision of all means all. The first belief in our special education plan is about inclusivity. It's about the importance of programming for each student within the classroom uh, situation or setting. In other words, it's about taking the special out of special education. It's about the programming. Our student learning and needs assessment tool for students is strength-based. It supports um, is, is, and, and this tool has been shared across the province in many districts. It's a collaborative strength-based tool which assists assistant <coughs> staff and school staff in determining which supports schools require to support the students in their school as well as, as, well as being able to have uh, enough to, to be able to provide uh, flexible funding going forward. Our, our approach is a collective approach. It's a shared responsibility. The student is at the very center, along with the partnering of system and community agencies to provide the support um, the students require for their learning. Some of the key, um, key achievements for the, for the, that we've been working on for this year and past years is that we have worked continuously to, to support and improve our IEP development and implementation. The focus this year re has remained on supporting improved IEP learning goals, effective uh, instructional strategies, and ongoing assessment of, as outlined uh, through the ministry documents of learning for all and growing success. We have uh, continued to increase the number of students supported in the regular classroom and school environments. This has occurred through the leadership of, of principals and their leadership belief that inclusion can really make a difference for their students. Oops, sorry. Uh, with, with regards to the ministry uh, document in the PPM 156, supporting students with special education needs, this year, we have focused on professional learning and growth with the transition planning for all students, uh, both coming to school, transitions during the school day, and transitions as, as they move into the world of work, college, or university. Thirdly, through the collaborative learning opportunities, we continue to provide professional learning opportunities and to enhance the capacity of school-based learning resource teachers learning resource coaches and classes, classroom teachers to better support the students uh, with SIA equipment and, and its software. <clears throat> with respect to the Empower Reading Program for non-readers, non during the 2013-14 year, we supported 20 schools with Empower Reading, which is a, fun, um, a decoding intervention for non-readers. This past year, we have continued to work with the, the revised gifted screening program and programming opportunities for students identified as gifted. For example, um, some of the, the, the work that we have done has included congregating online environments using the platform of Blink and Desire to Learn. Building staff capacity for students on the autism spectrum has been a continued focus. It's a continued focus right from the, the start of the year and all the way through. I think something we should be proud of is that in August, um, we had principals and, and their staff attending sessions. 
The participation in this professional learning was exceptional. From a budget point of view, this uh, resulted in uh, 209 teacher days that which, which were supported in the schools, 20 early childhood education days, and 54 educational assistant days. So all of that time was supported back um, within, within, within the school. From a revenue point of view, from our revenue uh, for our budget, the greatest change that you'll see within this is the, the high needs amount, including the SIP. I trust our, our director earlier at an earlier board meeting had brought this forward as the greatest risk. It is moved, the funding uh, formula for, the, for this has changed to a statistical model. So this is greatly impacting us. The challenge for us is that you, um, we are down in revenue this year. We know we will be going down. The challenge is that we do not know by how much and we do not have any more information from the ministry at this point in time. We've been promised it for the future, but this point in time for planning purposes, we know the model has changed and uh, the funding for that will be based on a statistical model on postal codes and other factors but uh, in order to plan two and three and four years out, we don't know, know the true effect of that. As you can see from the, this, this uh, pie graph, again, it shows that the two main funding, the two largest funding sources for us are through the, the CEPA and, and uh, the high needs amount. From the expenditure, um, Side, our expenditures, uh, I'm just going to go back actually to um, the revenue. The other thing is, is that in this past year, we do have some deferred revenue to carry forward. And that deferred revenue um, was planned. The bulk of that is SIA, uh, was planned through SIA in a five-year plan, which ends this year through the SIA funding. So for that, the other part of the <coughs> deferred revenue came from the, the labor situation last year. In, in, in the ability of, uh, for the professional learning days that we had planned, we were not able to do. From the expenditures, the bulk of our expenditure is on staff, on staffing for our teachers, our educational assistants, and our paraprofessionals. This is a, a graph showing the staffing in a four-year comparison by percentage. As I mentioned earlier, we have a robust student needs assessment. Principals, learning resource teachers, learning resource coaches are key in de determining the supports that they require for the students in their school. You can see that um, we have a slight increase in our educational assistance. And the reason, f one of the reasons <coughs> for that is with our, our uh, system designated classes. Three years ago, we had 30 uh, system designated classes. Coming up to this year, we will have 15 um, system, de system designated classes. The students uh, require support within their homeschool and classroom environment. So this has shifted um, some of the ways that we've supported. So that's why you see a slight increase in the number of educational assistants. The other, um, the comparison you'll see there is the growth of our child and youth workers. One, again, the, the school uh, work with us in terms of helping to determine the needs that they have. The other uh, reason for this uh, jump on this graph is that this year was the ending of a long-term agreement with Prescott Russell since an amalgamation. And at that point in time, we, um, it was a contract uh, we contracted uh, Valores, gave Valores the money to, to put uh, CYWs in, into our schools. This year, we will be staffing that ourselves. So the schools are still supported. They're going to be supported in a different way, and there are staff. Some key strategies going forward. 
We'll continue to uh, with the Empower Reading Program and scaling it out to, to an additional 40 schools, which include our K-6 schools, our intermediate and, and secondary schools. The cost of this is a one-time cost of $5,500 for each school, and that includes uh, um, the training and the follow-up training for the following year. So it train, um, entails training throughout the year, as well as a, another year follow-up. It's a one-time cost. We'll continue to support our, our schools to ensure that teachers, educational assistants are available for our student success team meetings with parents. It's very important that we do this because it's very um, for that so that uh, teachers are, and educational assistants are at, at the table along with the students so that teachers are, know their, their students learning as learners and students knowing themselves as learners. Those are the key ingredients in terms of we've done a lot of work and continue want to do, continue to do a lot of work with the, the student success team meetings. With respect to technology, we our, our planned release day. We have over the last past five years, we have built capacity within our system. At one point, we were contracting <coughs> out with a, the, a company you may have known of Software to Learn to help to provide the training for our students and staff over time. Part of this plan was to build the capacity in our, in our own staff and within our own system so we could deliver the training. So we're no longer contracting it out. We'll be uh, providing the release days and the support um, for our schools. We have a uh, new IEP uh, writer that, that is compatible with PowerSchool. Um, and it is relevant and, and meaningful and easier to, to use and and, um, and that will be rolling out. Uh, we've piloted it this year and we'll, we'll be rolling out in September. Another strategy going forward is uh, this is a pilot with a, a student leadership pilot, pilot. We know that the use of SIA devices drops dramatically in, in secondary. So with this pilot, we're building on the necessary for some good for all philosophy and piloting a peer uh, leadership course. Um, again, we know the great success we've had with Blink Crew. So we're piloting a peer leadership course at the secondary level with the goal of supporting both students and teachers with the effective uh, use of technology in, in the classroom. And just to conclude uh, my presentation, I just want to say that um, all means all is a very powerful and significant goal. And there's been a lot of hard work done. But the truth is the work is not complete. And there's always more to do. Okay, questions? Okay, thank you. Um, Trustee McMillan? Through you, Chair. Um, Superintendent Edwards, this is a, a significant amount of a budget and there's a lot of money here. When I look at some of the key strategies, I just, the question that I have, and I'm going to try to bring three questions into one, is why were some of these uh, strategies chosen and what are we doing to monitor the return of investment on these particular strategies? If I go to the first strategy with regards to the Empower Reading mm -hmm. um, strategy, we have a number of non-readers. So that, and a non-reader is a, a reader, uh, a student who is three three years or more behind within the reading, and we've piloted this out starting up, uh, up for two years, for the last two years, and the data coming back is that the, the students have made significant gains with regards to their PM benchmarks or or um, the Flint Cooter or any type of measurement we've done done that way. We've also heard from parents. Um, learning resource teachers and teachers um, with regards to the decrease in behavior. The students themselves speak of the profound difference. Main, always, many of these students the, have learning, the most of these students have a learning disability. It's by far the largest uh, group within our ex exceptionalities. And uh, the improved uh, and the greater engagement and the feedback we're getting has said that we have offered it. We're not. It's up to the schools to um, if they have non-readers, and it's, this is the strategy they want to uh, to support their readers. 
their, their students. We've, we've offered this and as well as the training. The other thing with the Empower Reading is it does build capacity within our staff with with the with the learning we we have the release days there the teacher release because the most important thing again is the classroom teacher the empower reading is a what we'd call a, a tier three or the highest level of intervention so it it, it uh, students or a group of students come out at some period during the day and uh, so we want to ensure the classroom teacher is part of that at, at some times to learn some of the strategies and the other feedback we've received is that from classroom teachers that the students are using these strategies in the classroom for readings and other, other subjects. So that's, that's um, why uh, for, for the key stat strategy for uh, the Empower Reading. And it relates directly to our graduation rate um, and, and students feeling uh, good about themselves and, and not dropping out uh, physically or emotionally um, through, throughout their journey. The other one, the student success team, the student at the very center of knowing themselves as a learner. We still have work to do in this and with transition planning uh, for, this, for the, the teachers and the students and the parents to all be equal partners at the, the table and, and to help support the, the, the student and, uh, going forward. So this is, this is a really, these are in terms of release days. The other part with the transition planning is that we've invested in a, um, in training and, and uh, for maps and paths. So bringing a full team of support of, for a student around and helping to plan where they, where, what, what are their hopes and dreams beyond, beyond uh, high school, beyond 21, and helping to plan early within, within that. So that's absolutely key. The technology support for school, that's directly related to our SIA. Um, as students come in with, with new devices, the staff come into new, new devices that we need to support within professional learning. So all of these areas here, you can see, really get at the part of uh, growing, growing our staff, building capacity within our staff and our professional learning. Trustee McAllister. Superintendent Edwards, uh, each of the key strategies going forward comports uh, a number of Teacher release, uh, teacher release days. Uh, if I were to add them up, they come to a minimum of 1,769 divided by 86 schools is 20.5 days per school. Um, this seems to me as, as a lot. How do we accommodate this fact? What is the impact on daily operations in a school? And are we examining alternate modes of delivery? To you, Chair. Um, all of this release time as well um, for the professional learning is, is embedded. So going, or the majority of it, I shouldn't say all of it, the majority of it is at the school um, level. So not going out to, um, to an event somewhere. So the majority is supported in acquiring that the, at, right at the school there. Um, it's up to the school principals as their leadership to, to juggle, juggle those pieces. The, the release days, if you break it down for school, when, when there is training or for uh, principals, for example, to, to access release days for student success team meetings, sometimes these meetings are during the day. They really work with the students and staff to accommodate <coughs> the time. Sometimes they're in the evening. They know they have the, the or after school, they have a budget code to, to access if needed. If they don't need it, it's not accessed. So it's, a, it's not, these days are not put right into this, the school budget. Principals have codes to access these days. I'm not, if, if that, does that answer your, your question? I think so. Trustee McRae. Thank you, Chair. So one thing we're um, all aware of is that um, the ministry has not yet um, made public what the funding formula is and how much money we're going to get for special education. So I guess my question is, within this budget, are there any lines that allow flexibility, any flexibility, um, that there might be some movement if, in fact, we weren't to get what we were feeling we would need to have? Through you, Chair. 
The key strategies going forward, this is planned and budgeted right now. It hasn't been stamped. So if there was a, if, if within the next months or, or a few weeks, if we have significant change going forward, we can take a look at look at this. Um, but at this, this point in time, if there is significant change, that would be the area of the staffing. We have staffed our schools right now. So you are looking at the, the key strategies. And you take a look at that. That is the, within the teacher release, uh, release days and, and the building of capacity within our staff. And the building, I cannot stress enough, the building of capacity is what has, is, has helped us grow and the success for our, our, our students along the way. So that would be, that, this, these items here are not spent till next year. There's time to plan. Trustee Buckland. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see you, uh, and uh, Trustee McAllister has asked uh, a most important question. And uh, I heard uh, Trustee, uh, or Superintendent Edwards mentioned juggling. I appreciate the juggling, but you know, people like Kozitsky and uh, Ken Robinson speak about special ed students needing um, continuity, needing a sense of security through uh, the same relationship throughout the year with the teacher, with the EA. And uh, I'll take uh, Trustee McAllister's math at the 1700 plus. Uh, tremendous amount of teacher release time. Add the uh, rupturing to a normal four day week with holidays, with PD, with other events. Uh, this is uh, insecurity heading for serious problems. And where we have students with hindrances to learning and uh, learning disabilities, I think we have to pay extra attention to creating a sense of stability through continuity of the same individuals. So, dealing with these students. Is this true? Are we doing this? Superintendent uh, Edwards? To you, Chair Peterson, I couldn't agree with you more that the continuity and um, the impo importance of uh, a classroom teacher in front of the students is key. The release days up there um, are, are across all of our, our school, uh, school days, you know, throughout the calendar year. And again, um, I point to that they're not, it's not carved in stone. There, these, this time is available during the school for our principals to access, to grow the capacity of their staff. Sometimes professional learning does happen after school. Sometimes student success teams, and many times actually meetings with parents does happen after school. But from a budgeting point of view, um, we, we, we feel that we have to budget for during the school, the school <coughs> year, or school day, sorry. But I agree with you, uh, uh, you know, Trustee Buckland, that we really do work to have um, the classroom teacher in front of the, uh, the, stu uh, of the student and that consistency. Trustee Parker? Chair, this is just a, a concern I have about the release days as well, and I'm not going to belabor this, but I just hope that the release days are used by the principals to have an adult, a teacher, an EA with the child so that there is continuity, that they aren't just shifted somewhere in the school for the day whenever those people are, are on uh, training. The training is very, very important, but the consistency for the children is as well. So. No question. Trustee Swan. For you, Chair, I, I'd just like some more information on the revised gifted screening and enhanced programming. And what are our goals? I didn't really see it in the chart and the costs associated with it. And where do we hope to be? Go ahead. To, to you, Chair. Yes, yeah, so with the revised screening, um, it, it used to be that the gifted, um, for a student to be identified as gifted, they would have to be identified in two categories. 
now with our new revised screening uh, for gifted programming is just in with, within one one category um, for, for because in our our number of students with exceptionalities our gifted population was other, always under rep, uh, represented with with respect to the enhanced uh, programming that we've done a number of things we've, we've we're working towards uh, the collaborative um, space with regards to the desire to learn for our students uh, last week is, or last week yes one of uh, from Almont at R. Tate McKenzie um, within the audit they talked about the collaborative space and and some students uh, working with an, um, in an online gaming field the other uh, thing we've done with the enhanced programming is uh, we have uh, um, secured through e-learning we have supported e-learning for reach ahead math programs across the system and uh, the third thing again is to build the capacity and the growth within our uh, within our staff so bringing teams together school teams together along with our psych associates and some of our system staff to help teachers our learning resource coaches our principals understand the different profiles of the gifted learner and, and we've had uh, some parents and other people who have been identified as gift come in to talk to that, to hear the stories and understand um, from a gifted perspective and to help our staff understand that, to help them with teach within their classrooms. There's still more work to be done along this line, but those are some of the things that we've done this year. Thank you. Can I have a secondary, please? Sure, go ahead. Are we receiving any funding for our working gifted uh, in working towards helping our gifted learners? Go ahead, Superintendent Edwards. For you, Chair, the, the funding that, that um, we receive is the, the funding from the ministry and, and it's how we, we choose to um, allocate it. So that's, we, we, we have portioned that off. We have expended that through our professional learning. We don't. We don't receive target. If you're asking if we receive targeted uh, funding for gifted uh, students, we don't receive targeted funding for gifted students. Thank you, because I didn't see that in the chart. So, which, lastly, if I may, chair, which line is it coming out of under the funding under GSM? Um, it, it is on the. Um, is it director? Do you have the answer for that? For the which. Through your, it's coming out of the SEPA funding. Yeah. It comes out of the special education budget. Yeah. There's no specific line. No. Okay. Trustee McPherson? Yeah, I have three questions based upon slide number four. Discretion of chair, I'll ask all three. Or sure, to go take ahead. Turn. Um, you mentioned through the chair, the SIA funding, that this was the last year of, I believe, a multiple year rollout. I realize it doesn't affect us for this year, but is there any anticipation that those dollars will renew in subsequent years? So from now, going on a going forward basis, we receive $1.5 million on that line. Um, for the foreseeable future, and we haven't. The ministry has not uh, given us any indication that would change. So we're, we're projecting on approximately 1.5 million on an ongoing basis. So would it be fair for to take the understanding that they have simply changed the delivery model of those monies? Yeah. Okay. Uh, second question. Uh, you have a uh, line here of the high needs amount. And I realize that we've had considerable warning that this was going to be in a declining mode. Uh, you are presenting a figure of roughly 19 million plus dollars. Um, am I correct in assuming that this is our <coughs> best estimate, or is that number reflective of the ministry's indi uh, indications? Through you, Chair. We have that. Have, that is the number that we have been given from the ministry for okay. for this year, on an ongoing basis. We don't 
we don't have any projections of what that will be for next year okay. following this. Okay. And third and final question. Um, in the black lettering, second line from the bottom. Uh, no, first line. Other funding revenue. We see a decrease there of over two million dollars. What falls underneath that envelope? What kind of money is that? Where does it come from? And what is the rationale behind a decrease of over two million dollars? Through chair and colleagues may left me be able to answer this better but last year uh, within that was uh, we received funding for um, early early kindergarten through DCE and, and, and uh, support that way and this year that's been uh, rolled into the GSNs thank you I have a question then. Um, the deferred revenue line, um, how is there more deferred revenue? Or is that all that we year? would count as deferred revenue? So the three and a half million. That is the deferred revenue. The bulk of that is from SIA. Mm rolled for which is about uh, I believe about two million from last year that's the last year for this 1.8 million and the other um, deferred revenue there was from uh, mainly from the professional learning line from last year so do we have to spend do you did you have to use all of that deferred revenue in this year or could you, did you have the option of carrying deferred revenue for an additional year through you, through you, Chair, um, we have the best plan um, that we have always worked with is to plan for spending an expenditure of deferred revenue. So our deferred revenue, our plan deferred revenue going forward for the last five years was through SIA, and so we had planned on spending that this year. We had plans for spending the two million to continue with the infrastructure, continue with the growth. So um, there are times, as is last year, you know, we understand with the impact of a budget like this that one a one percent or two percent, the implications of one one percent, two percent on either other side. So with our professional learning and with our staffing, we tend to we budget at the higher end of the grid to ensure that we don't uh, overspend. So there are times when we we do end up with a one percent or two percent. Uh, surplus and that, that rolls into the following year. Trustee McDonald? Thank you. Slide uh, nine. When you talk, your key strategy is going forward. You have your key strategy, you have the setup, what's the cost, uh, I'm assuming, uh, future release days, and the budgeted amount. In the budgeted amount, is that accumulation? Is that a uh, sum of the setup and the future release days? That's correct. That's a charge of approximately two hundred and fifty dollars per release day. Okay. Okay. So I guess that makes sense. Two hundred forty-seven thousand dollars. So on your teacher release days that you have, if we go back up to your expenditures, does that come out of the supply teacher line? Yes, and if you see the staff development line as well. Okay. So staff development covers supply teachers typically? Yes. So that's a significant increase from last year on staff development. Through you, Chair. It, that's correct. Last year, um, as again, we're part of our, because of the, the the labor situation, we did not spend all, we didn't, although we had budgeted, we did not um, build the capacity within that area. The other uh, area that we uh, were not able to move forward with last year, but we did this year, was we added two autism therapists as well for our staffing. Yep, go ahead. So on the, the 
dollars that I'm seeing here for 2013-14 in expenditures, you have 272,000 for staff development. It's a six, almost $600,000 increase into 2014-15. <coughs> that looks like new money to me. But what you're saying is it was budgeted and didn't wasn't spent. So, on the dollars well, that. If you take a look at um, on the deferred revenue line here, in terms of our total uh, with our total budget. So with our deferred revenue line, we had approximately two million from deferred from our Garcia, which is planned and going forward, planned for going forward and spending for this year. Within that as well, we had um, I believe it was a two percent, three percent um, surplus or deferred that went into the deferred revenue line. Mr. Richards, um, is this a comment back to slide four there? The budget, I think our parents will be very happy to hear that there is no decrease in EAs and teachers, but I have real concerns about next year when we don't have that 3.5 million to bring from the um, deferred amount into the budget because next year I think it might be a real problem. Is that your assessment too, Superintendent Edwards? Through, through you, you Chair. Um, that is why we're waiting to, we have a number of plans going forward um, with regards to um, the revenue that we receive. We have, again, uh, we, we have a robust student needs assessment. So the very first part is supporting our, our students with, within the supports that they need within staff and supports within, within their school. So we do have a, a number of plans, but we do need to that, uh, and scenarios and models that we can roll, uh, roll out, but we haven't had a chance to really do this because uh, at this point in time, we, we don't know the revenue coming in. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Edwards. Um, Okay, so our next uh, presentation will be from Superintendent of Business, Barclay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to try hard to stay within my 10 minutes. Oh, you will. You will. I will. Everything is in the narrative, so I will indeed go quickly. Firstly, this is just to show you the business admin structure. Uh, which is comprised of many uh, many components, many uh, many departments with uh, different objectives. Just to kind of describe the uh, operating context we're operating under this year. Uh, in our department, we have 14 staff who are either new to a role or new to the organization as a whole. Uh, the labor framework, as Jennifer McDonald from uh, HR talked about, uh, greatly impacted payroll and accounting's work to implement those changes. As trustees are aware, ministry budget compliance uh, has been a challenge. And coming out of that uh, were the several financial forecasts that we prepared administratively to keep uh, our eye on that. Uh, we also made adjustments in January, which also entailed quite a bit of work. And another thing coming out of our compliance challenge was the school budget uh, planning project uh, that uh, Tracy May and I and some people in the county were involved in. Uh, despite all of that, uh, we continued to uh, process all the transactions. People were paid, vendors were paid. Uh, we uh, met our reporting requirements and went through all of our uh, audit cycles. All external reporting requirements were met uh, during the year, and we had our fourth uh, clean external audit by KPMG, fourth one in a row. As well, the department budget we were operating with was decreased by 3% on the non-salary and benefit lines uh, in line with the enrollment decline. In the uh, narrative, there are uh, many projects. I've chosen a few just to talk about in 2013-14. Uh, 
Uh, I won't talk about the forecast, the first one, because uh, I already have. The second one, we had an objective to um, continue with the project we started in 1213 to gradually convert our vendors over to electronic funds transfers, transfer to avoid uh, cutting checks and mailing checks. Uh, I'm pleased that we met that goal of 66%. Uh, we will uh, continue that now into 1415. Uh, that particular project we, we have estimated has generated $8,000 per year in savings. Uh, may not sound like much in a $350 million budget, but it is fairly significant within our department. Uh, the Eucaris payroll project is where we uh, were successful in implementing electronic timesheets for our elementary occasional teachers. Um, it was a challenging project in that uh, getting data from Eucaris uh, was really not, uh, Eucaris wasn't intended to feed payroll, so there was a challenge in getting that data over. Um, we did spend some money, invested about $4,000 for some temporary help to backfill, um, and a lot of staff time. Um, but this part, and once we implement electronic timesheets for our other groups, uh, we've estimated will save us about $20,000 per year. The labor framework implementation, uh, I don't think I need to talk to that as Jennifer did a good job of that. In internal audit, um, the uh, Tracy May and uh, her helper have been busy. One of the things they focused on was uh, enrollment audits, which was relatively new uh, for them to complete. Uh, given that the internal auditor was involved in some other projects that came to be during the year, uh, she is 75% uh, complete that work, and that's where it will probably stay for this year. So didn't quite make the mark there, but uh, made a really good start, and that will continue in 1415. Uh, also, an internal audit uh, incorporated purchasing cards audits into the regular audit cycle. That's been completed. And uh, school budget planning, which trustees are aware of, um, was another project uh, that the internal audit department was involved in. As far as our purchasing group, uh, school cafeterias, uh, that group continued to work towards compliance to PPM uh, 150. Uh, that shows uh, a target of uh, spending the $50,000 that was approved and right now the status is 25% and that really will be 100 uh, at the end of the summer because those installations of ovens will happen during the summer. Health and safety, uh, student injury prevention, this project was stemming from some Ministry of Labor inspections that took place in 2012. So the ministry uh, provided $99,000 in funding. And, um, and as far as impact, I, I simply put uh, student safety and compliance, which of course is extremely important. The other project in the health and safety area was physical education equipment inspections. Uh, this was an internal initiative out of uh, UCDSB approved budget of $90,000. Um, and um, that work has been completed. That was based on inspections done by a third party. Under risk management community use, uh, our community use coordinator, uh, working closely with Superintendent Allen, uh, completed revisions to the procedures for community use to provide some consistency across the board. Uh, those will take effect September 1st, 2014, and there were no incremental dollars spent to do that. And kind of a nice one, um, we were able to install another 53 AEDs in our locations uh, thanks to the Heart and Stroke Initiative. So all of our Upper Canada locations now have uh, an AED and people have been trained on them. So our budget structure is mainly uh, salaries and benefits, um, recurring commitments about 25% and a little bit 5% left for project work. Looking at this schedule and looking from 1213 to looking forward to 1415, um, our staff complement has remained uh, 
fairly constant. I'm going to just explain briefly the fluctuation, fluctuations there. Um, the increase by two in 13, 14, and these are all budgeted numbers, by the way. Um, that was uh, a temporary AP, one of them was a temporary accounts payable staff member uh, that we brought in because we did have an unexpected long-term absence in one of our positions, our functional analyst position. Uh, we also had a budgeted health and safety position, an incremental one, that we did not fill, and that was decided in January when we made the adjustments to, uh, to the budget because of all of the requests that we could not fund. Then moving on to 14-15, uh, you no longer, of course, see those those two positions. And we had also budgeted for another health and safety manager position, which now uh, is vacant and we will not be, be filling. On the, uh, the dollar side, the salaries and benefits correlate with the FTE. Um, our recurring commitments, um, you'll see uh, an increase in 13-14. That was because of the transfer from other budgets, department budgets, school budgets of the uh, cell phone costs. So those have been brought into the uh, business admin budget. And as well, the other increase in recurring commitments related to the student injury prevention uh, dollars that we had. 14-15, as far as recurring commitments, stays about the same down slightly. As far as uh, project work, looking forward to 1415, the 191,000 is uh, a proposed uh, amount of $100,000 for us to redesign our code of accounts and improve our management reports. And there's also some money in there to continue on with the uh, electronic timesheets for the other uh, payroll groups. There's also another amount, which is some ministry funding for, from, uh, for, they call it reporting entity funding, that we would also put towards our management reports. This is just another view of the same. So moving to our projects for 14-15, the new chart of accounts and management reports. Uh, you might wonder why it's yellow. It's yellow because it is still a challenge to free up staff to work on projects that are of any magnitude and uh, therefore uh, the caution why it is there. Uh, as well, we have a new functional analyst that we have finally recruited. Uh, she started in April, so there's a big learning curve as far as learning PeopleSoft, uh, learning our business, learning our processes, uh, which is, is another, another caution. Uh, I've already talked, I think, enough about the uh, electronic timesheets. Next one is the electronic T4 project. This is one that we really want to accomplish. We were well on our way in 13-14 to do this and at the same time to issue T4s earlier. Uh, but again, because of the unexpected vacancy that we had in a key role, we were not able to produce electronic T4s. We still did get the T4s out by the required date. So our plan in 14-15 is to revisit that and uh, move to electronic T4s, saving about $7,000 per year. The R34 school budget planning I've put in the list because I anticipate, uh, based on the proposed actions, that uh, finance staff and school support staff will certainly um, have some work to do in that regard. Purchasing area in 1415, we'll be looking at planning and developing furniture and equipment budgets for our two new elementary schools. Um, that, of course, is ministry funded. And health and safety, um, this relates to uh, trying to reduce our WSIB claims and uh, doing more safety awareness with regards to overexertion and strains and slips and falls. I put it as yellow just because you can make people aware whether that will actually reduce claims. I hope it does. Uh, we will see. And under risk management community use, concussion protocol, uh, Judy Kaiser is working with Superintendent Coombs to get that protocol in place by January 30th. 
2015. Uh, no incremental investment in dollars there. And uh, Judy also has an OSBE related project um, because there are new audit standards related to gymnasium facilities and equipment, outdoor premises and equipment and science labs. Again, no investment of dollars, but something that she will be working on. So to wrap it up, uh, key challenges that uh, we see for our department, uh, we continue with the challenge of increased complexity, uh, complexity of formulas, complexity of forms, complexity of understanding all of the different pieces of funding that are coming at us throughout the year. Uh, the reporting and all of the reporting requirements that we have <coughs> numerous times throughout the year and our ongoing view to be being compliant. The strategy to address that challenge is to continue to grow uh, the skill base of the folks that we have in-house so that uh, others can uh, pitch in when time permits to help with some of these reporting requirements, audits, etc. cetera. Um, we want to continue to collaborate with other departments to improve our common processes, HR being one of, one of the key ones. When we have the opportunity, uh, we take it, our recruiting very seriously and we take our time to find the right person with the right skills for the position. That can definitely be a challenge when we're trying to fill intermediate or senior finance positions or unique positions such as a PeopleSoft functional analyst. And another strategy is to keep our eye on what are the highest priorities. Second major challenge for us is the size of our budget and our staff capacity. Uh, the operational demands of the business department require the full capacity of the staff that our budget affords. Um, we will work, continue to work to make some gradual gains and efficiencies as we can. Again, collaborate with other departments and continue cross-training to build skills. And Upper Canada budget pressures, the last one with which you're very familiar. Um, with enrollment at the secondary panel due to demographics anticipated to continue to decline over the next few years, coupled with the province's uh, fiscal reality, uh, we believe budgets will be a challenge to balance in the, in the future. So that provides a challenge for the business department and for all of us. Our strategies there uh, are to continue with our quarterly forecast so we have an eye on, on where we believe we're going and to work with our colleagues to uh, fine tune those forecasts, to uh, initiate more long-term planning so rather than waiting always for the GSNs each year, looking forward, uh, projecting revenue to the extent that we can and uh, do some more long-term planning and to continue uh, collaborating as a senior team um, while maintaining a, a focus on student learning but re realizing and addressing our fiscal realities. So that is uh, the presentation for business administration. So you were right. You were over. Was that by how much? Well, so we're we're trying to figure out uh, some appropriate penalties and you know, maybe wash all the cars in the parking lot. And I'll start with my own. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, questions, trustees? Trustee McDonald. Thank you. Um, just wanted to go to the slide on 2000, 2013 uh, 14 projects. Four, slide four. Coercion of vendors to electronic funds transfer. So you finished that particular one 100%. When I look at last year's budget, there was an anticipation that only have 66% done at the end of this year. So this project, you, it seems you were able to advance it quickly. You're able to do that with other projects. Through you, Chair. Uh, the way I've presented this is the description, you're, you're correct, says the goal was 66% to be converted to electronic funds transfers. We met that goal, so we're saying we've met 100% of our target. It doesn't mean we've converted 100% of the 
of the vendors. We, we met 100% of the goal that we had set, which was to convert 66%. So you should be at 66% then, and you still have your balance left to go, which would give you 100% completion of the whole project. Yeah, this, well, yes, through you, Chair. Um, th this is how I did them all. Um, I looked at what was, what was the target, if we met it, it was 100%. So the target could have said we're going to implement 50%, and if we implemented 50%, we said the target, we, we said we had accomplished 100% of what we said we would do. So your goal isn't to hit 100% of electronic fund transfer? No, the goal is to hit 66%. I don't see 66% in there. It's yet. in the description. Choose, yeah. Also, so your year end target should be 66% and your status should be 66%? No. But their, their goal was to complete 66, to have 66% 66 of their vendors participate in electronic funds transfer. They've met that, so they've achieved 100% of the goal. So well then, that, but you need to say that because that's not what this says, in my view. Oh, that's why we were. Your year end target's one hundred percent. No, they only ever targeted. They only ever set the. They only ever intend to hit a target of sixty six percent. When you look at the chart, it says my target is one hundred percent. My status is. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, your target column is misleading. Yeah, I get how. What do you mean? Through you, Chair, we can we can do it differently next year. I just delete the target. Oh, no, I guess you could have only wanted to do half of the project this year. Is what you're saying? So they could have only wanted to get halfway through the project in this year. Yeah, I mean it's confusing to me because I'm I'm thinking right now when I look at this that we're not going to spend any more money on it. We're done. That's what I think. Yeah. But I think they are done. They're not going to spend any more money on reducing the number of check issues, correct? Through you, Chair. We will continue in 1415 now to implement the other 34%. Uh, and in both of these cases, we, we haven't invested any money except for staff time. So you're right. To complete it. I think you're right. <laughs> That's on okay. it. It's recorded. But, uh, <laughs> Can I ask another one now? Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, in the 2014-15 projects, you have the one that I got a little upset with last year, BIMP. Last year, BIMP? This has been an ongoing process. So BIMP last year, we were anticipating to be somewhere around 65%. BIMP for the last two years was about $500,000. So if this year moving into, and first of all, I don't see it on the status report for 13-14, but in 14-15, our target is to be at 100%. What are we at now, currently? And if we've already spent $500,000, now we're going to go back and put another 100000 in? Is that what I'm reading? I'm just going to back up to, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Through you, Mr. Chair, the numbers for project work on that screen, so the $458,240 in 12-13, those are budgeted dollars. We postponed that project. We did not spend that money. We postponed the project because we decided, because it was going to cost so much, we needed to step back, review it, and assess whether we needed to, or whether we should stay with our present software. We have now, we are now planning to, and we've done work already on designing a code of accounts. And basically, we've, we've cut it into smaller chunks, and we really feel that our code of accounts is uh, not easy to, for users to understand because it doesn't focus in on responsibility centers consistently. And because of that, we cannot easily generate 
management reports that users find useful. On top of that, when we're doing our financial forecasts, the Q1, Q2, Q3, those are very labor intensive to produce. So we are going back and we are going to start with just the code of accounts and the existing management reports using that new code of accounts. Hey, go ahead. So if we budgeted uh, almost half a million dollars last year and we, pulled, we, didn't, we didn't do that, and my status of the project, because I don't recall us saying we were going to put it on hold at any point, so our status of the 2013-14 projects should indicate that that BIMP was on there. We anticipated to get to 65% so we got to, we didn't do anything, so we should have still been at whatever it was, 35% previously. But we've got 70% left to do on BIMP. We anticipated it being $500,000 for two years in a row. Now we're only going to spend $100,000 to move. So the, the scope That's what we requested budget-wise, yes. Okay, so the scope is significantly reduced mm -hmm. um, because we're only going to look at code of accounts. What happened to the money that we didn't spend last year then? The money that, through you, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. The money that we didn't spend would have fallen to, to the bottom line into our accumulated surplus. So in other words, what you're really saying is that in future, um, the original project should still be on there. There should be an indication that the scope was changed so that we can then either you, you kill that project, end that project, and start a new one. So that we can see that it wasn't done, and that essentially you've rescoped the project. So it's not the same project really at all anymore. Okay. I think that's reasonable. Yep. Um, is it your intention next year to have the slide colors match the uh, outfits that present? <laughs> I didn't notice that somebody else did and mentioned it to me, so I, I stole the joke, but it's very effective. Um, it's looking this way. Dusty Buffer. I appreciate the code coordination as well. This is the most uh, comprehensive and uh, exhaustive report by the treasurer. I'd like to focus on five uh, risk management community use, particularly community use. And uh, I'm extremely wary, uh, concerned, cautious, uh, when I see complete revision, centralized process for consistency. So uh, my fear is that uh, in doing this, um, we may have come up, I like, use the metaphor of the peanut butter compromise, uh, some wanted strawberry jam, others of us wanted honey, and so we compromised, and neither got what they wanted. Um, it leads to the value of small schools beyond what we've done. For example, two examples here. One, um, we closed Martintown Public for an educational reason, but it uh, caused uh, a diminishing in the cultural from the village as well. A couple of groups became more abund, uh, one dispersed, and uh, one moved. Recently, under the system that's being applied, uh, a community leader told me, well, we wanted to hold a community effort, and we were told we could do it in the next community for nothing. But this wasn't our community, so the, you know, that cultural event then uh, somehow raised the $250, $300 they needed to cover those costs. So I do hope, I hope you are not looking at this as a uh, revenue, uh, as a revenue maker because you know we have to ask who are these community groups well in many cases uh, they do contribute to our school functions uh, they are our students uh, they're available for school functions and uh, as well I, I like the principal the dr community leader and in the, in our area in the east uh, there have been some mutual uh, sharing of uh, property and uh, and equipment and so on that has resulted in benefits in a concomitant way to both. So uh, 
when you say this centralized, does this mean there will be no uh, deviance in uh, any way from uh, some kind of centralized uh, figure that's being set here in uh, Brockville? Okay, was that a question or more of a mm -hmm. statement, Trustee Buckland? Maybe restate the question. Yes, will there be any possibility for considering uh, local input and uh, political help from some of these groups who are not uh, are not financially viable, but uh, principals have been able to make deals in the past. For example, use of soccer in in Williamstown. Here, if you use the soccer field. We get to use their air conditioning facilities for uh, our examinations and their rink in the winter for facilities. So these are examples of uh, a mutually agreeable and uh, mutually benefiting deals. Now, is this uh, finished as a possibility in the, in the rental rates for our school properties? Uh, Superintendent Allen. You want to talk about the uh, flexibility that you afford on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. We do, uh, uh, through you, Chair, we do have some reciprocal agreement with uh, in some areas, but I think the new procedure and policy that's laid out and it's been approved by the board is uh, really adds for that flexibility in every community that every community has similar access. So we do, um, we are wor we work with every community group to. Uh, Try and allow as uh, maximum access in the uh, in the communities. I think to some extent, uh, Trustee Buckland, I think your your concerns might be better um, discussed or uh, around the review of that particular policy. Well, I was going to add. It's going to add to the flexibility in the process. Is that is that what you heard, Mr. Chair? Um, I think that there is flexibility. You know, the I think the flexibility that yeah. Superintendent Allen, I don't need to speak for her. Superintendent mm -hmm. Allen, make sure that the that Trustee Buckland understands what you mean. Um, in the policy, through you, Chair, in the policy and procedures, there is uh, there are designated sites in every family school that have free access for community groups based on the policy and procedure. Um, and we do, um, in the other question that he asked about reciprocal groups, I think he made reference to a music group that um, um, was requesting to use the school. Those sort of things we have, we have met with schools and uh, in some cases we've been able to do a reciprocal use. I think the, the parameters of the policy and procedure, the procedure in particular, um, allows for the maximum use of our schools though, but um, in every community, that's our goal. I think in fairness, or really I would encourage you, Trustee Buckland, to, um, uh, to get at your concerns more through the review of the policy. Because <coughs> really the review, the policy is, is driving the budget line, not the other way around. Trustee McPherson? Um, I was part of the group that met with the communities on this issue and I recently did a booking for an event that I'm planning this fall and despite my misgivings about doing it online it was a very straightforward process you answer a few simple questions and within hours my booking was confirmed so I really think that it has simplified the process, uh, not prolonging this discussion because we've got a lot of ground to cover yet. But I think that they've done an excellent job and I know the staff that I was talking to were way more than helpful on it, so. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you. Superintendent uh, of Business Berkeley. Uh, old, an old face. 
face we saw with a great deal more frequency. Um, now uh, CAO and General Manager CEO, uh, Mr. Kotman, is here to talk about the uh, transportation um, uh, budget. Uh, thanks very much for uh, making yourself available and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's certainly a pleasure to be here this evening and um, I'm happy to uh, present the, um, the transportation budget. Um, so on the first slide, just showing you the STEO org chart. Um, so Student Transportation of Eastern Ontario is a separate legal entity, and it's governed by uh, the STEO Board of Directors, representatives um, from the member boards. Um, my position is CAO and then staff um, following me. Um, we have an administrative committee that provides support as well. The scope of a responsibility. Um, so the mission is to deliver uh, safe, effective and efficient transportation while providing outstanding customer service to school personnel, parents, peers, employees, and members of the community. STEO's credo is to be res respective and responsive to the needs of the member boards, schools, families, and students, and operate in a seamless manner as if managed by the boards themselves. These students, uh, th these services, um, include providing transportation for approximately 21,476 students to 106 schools and 18 learning centers. This slide shows you the learning centers that we currently provide transportation to. Um, 64 elementary schools, 22 secondary, 14 TR Leger, 3 ABLE, 9 Foundation, 5 Section 23s, and uh, transition programs for a total of 121 sites. The 2013-14 financial projections, so we have total revenue of approximately 24 million, um, forecasted expenditures for home to school transportation is 22,775,000, with administrative costs totaling 1.497, um, 1,497,000. We're forecasting a deficit this year of approximately $37,000. For this current year, our challenges and strategies. Um, so our challenges for this coming school year have been and, and continue to be over the last number of years, rising fuel costs, um, unexpected legal costs um, and ongoing legal costs, as well as un unexpected uh, transportation requirements for additional vehicles, which happens on a regular basis. Um, and this year we had our efficiency and effectus, effectiveness review by the Ministry of Transportation, uh, sorry, by the Ministry of Education that took a, a great deal of time for the department to um, uh, prepare for. It took us, um, we spent the last two years preparing for the e and &E review, which occurred on March 25th. So our strategies in dealing with these challenges has been um, rising fuel costs continue to be a, uh, a concern However, we've been able to identify operational efficiencies that has permitted us to, um, to absorb and deal the, with the increased fuel costs. As well, through operational efficiencies, the consortium has been able to control um, and keep um, expenditures under control um, as a result of required or additional vehicles. For the 2014 um, 15 budget total revenue we're forecasting at about twenty four million nine hundred seventeen thousand dollars total expenditures home to school transportation is uh, approximately twenty three million two hundred and fifty four thousand with administrative costs totaling one point five six six million and we're forecasting a surplus of approximately ninety six thousand uh, dollars for next year um, some notes the budget aligns with steel's current um, operational 2014-15 um, <coughs> strategic plan. Um, the total budget for steel is approximately $37,304,000 of which $24,296,000 is uh, um, the Upper Canada's portion. For 2014-15 uh, the operating budget for steel um, has been approved by the Steel Board of Directors, which was approved on April 29th. The challenges 
Um, facing the consortium, again, our rising fuel costs is a challenge for the transportation industry across the country and across the world. Um, unexpected legal costs, um, unexpected transportation requirements for additional vehicles that occur throughout the school year, and changes to funding levels directly from the Ministry um, of Education. Our strategies in dealing with these unexpected costs or, or um, challenges our uh, rising fuel costs again continue to be or provide us with issues. Um, however, we're constantly trying to find operational efficiencies to uh, absorb or try and keep uh, increased costs under control. Um, so, highlights um, for the 2014 um, 15 school year. Um, we're, we're, the ministry has provided us with a fuel escalator de-escalation formula where they provide funding for a proportion of our increased fuel costs. Um, funding will either escalate or de-escalate based upon actual fuel costs. So uh, budgeted expenditures have been um, calculated using an average cost of about $1.17. So we've budgeted $1.17 for the current year, uh, and that's net of HST. And discounts, which is equivalent to about a dollar thirty-four per liter. Um, we've also identified some routing efficiencies for this current year, where we've uh, identified about one hundred sixty thousand dollars in, in savings. We have, we're forecasting for inclement weather days, um, and there'll be some savings as a result of that. Cost increases were included, which equate to approximately two percent increase in home to school transportation for the for the board. This will be offset by a 2% increase in funding that was allocated to the board uh, from the ministry. The following slide um, shows average fuel trends. And you can see over the last number of years, um, fuel costs have increased significantly. Um, from uh, 2002, 2003 to 60 cents a liter to um, this current year, at this point in time, um, $1.18 is the average. Um, so we're, we forecasted for next year at $1.34 per liter. One of the challenges we face is that uh, in this particular slide, fuel costs versus funding are received. So that we have the fuel, es the, uh, fuel escalator clause that the ministry provides, which accounts for about 12% funding. However, right now, with as fuel continues to rise, the cost of fuel, that gap between the funding and what we actually, um, what it costs us increases. Um, so that certainly has been a challenge um, for the transportation industry as a whole. So in summary of new initiatives for 2014-15, uh, the goal is to ensure that students <coughs> operate in a highly effective and efficient manner. Um, so we're looking at updating our computer software to improve efficiency and eliminate the duplication of error, or of effort, sorry. Um, we're looking at purchasing uh, performance measurement software that allow us to measure our financial and operational efficiencies, identify where we were, where we are, and where we're going to go in the future. We're looking at increasing um, safety training for our staff, for bus drivers, and for students um, through a number of different uh, formats and uh, processes. We want to enhance our website further enhance it with online training for drivers and for students. And we're going to continue, we've started over the last number of years, a Driver of the Season Award. Um, so we're looking to in, in, uh, continue with that and to provide for this coming school year um, a Driver Appreciation Day, which will happen in the spring of 2015. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. And thank you for being so patient. Only took three and a half hours to get to you. <laughs> uh, comments, questions? Trustee McAllister. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you, Ron. Um, what were the results of the uh, Ministry Efficiency and Effectiveness Review, if you have them yet, and what do you anticipate that impact will be on our revenues, and when will it kick in? So through, through, through you, Chair. Um, we haven't gotten the results of the uh, E&E re re uh, review yet. The Ministry has indicated that we won't get those results till after the election. And that'll take probably about three to four weeks after the after this week, uh, depending on which government, um, which if there's a new government. Um, 
we are anticipating that, that we forecasted our rating into the into the budget. So there was a deficit last year, and we forecasted um, that adjustment into next year's budget. Thank you, Mr. Gartner. Uh, through you, Chair, Vice Chair, um, we all received letters from a company that said they were going to withdraw services. Uh, does that impact us in any way? It uh, it won't. Um, Stock Transportation uh, notified Steel that they no longer wish to provide service. If they, if they didn't get uh, a substantial rate increase for the coming school year. Um, and as a result of that, we've um, allocated all those routes to existing con contractors within Steel, except for a very small few. Um, but um, so they've all been allocated to existing operators that fully are, are fully aware of our operation. Other questions? Um, thank you, uh, Ron. <coughs> there has um, there's an opportunity to find out potential savings through the course of the year um, by just looking at ages of vehicles. Is that has that been completed? Is that wrapped up? And how will that impact the budget? Through you, Chair. Um, we're we're doing that review. We've communicated with all the contractors regarding age of vehicle. And we've given them till June, thir June 30th to get back to us to indicate if they're going to use existing vehicles or purchase um, new vehicles. Okay. And just to follow up, so based on some of those things and in doing the review, there is savings associated to it. So what we're looking at is just a fund um, or a request, I guess, for funds based on our policies and our operational um, requirements um, to provide the money to steal. And if there's any savings that would go into the surplus and then at what point, or at some point, Upper Canada could either pull back or maintain in, in Steele's um, surplus account. Is that correct? Or? Um, well, we've always been running very close to our budget, and over the last few years we were actually running a deficit. So we do have um, students that are arriving over an hour, an hour. So our goal is to try and reinvest that money to provide better service to the boards and better service to our students and uh, families. So that percentage of students that have the longer <coughs> ride time, so there's transfers, just to look at where can we provide more efficient and effective service. Through you, Chair. Yeah, just yeah, do the follow-up, and we'll get to you in a moment there, Trustee Swan. But, but if, it's, if it's within our policy, and there's um, savings associated to the E&E &E review, or, or anywhere for that matter, over the course of the year, that would have to be discussed at the steel board and then come back to the to this board because if, if this board felt that we want to maintain our policy and um, provide the services that we're already looking at um, then that would be something that we would we would do so it wouldn't be an automatic that we would take two hundred thousand and we invest it in somewhere else it would be a conversation through you chair um, yes that's correct dave can you put this on a cell so you heard it please for me um, Trustee Swan. Trustee McAllister. I'm going to uh, assert that my, my question is budget related, but how successful have you been in integrating um, bus routes for the two boards? Over the last, uh, through you, Chair? Yeah, go ahead. Over the last um, couple of years, we were at about 2% where we were sharing prior to coming together as a consortium. Since that time, we're now at approximately 7%, and we're continuing that process of, of integration with a goal on um, the next few years to potentially try and get to 25%. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Trustee Swan, are you ready with your question now? Trustee Buckland? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, two, two questions. One, uh, um, just a delight to see you here. In uh, do we, so do we now have the same uh, level of uh, transportation for our students before and after school as our sister board with the same costs? Sure. Okay. Um, we, we have the same level of service, so our, our objective is to provide the same level of service between both boards, and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, we're providing that level of service. 
Thank you. Uh, one more. I, I certainly support this. What a wonderful idea school board sharing. Um, if you look ahead, do you think, see any future groupings? I mean, for example, we have the Mohawk uh, students on their own system, plus, uh, you know, French language uh, boards. Go ahead, Trudisha. Um, right now, the, the structure across the province is that the English boards have the English consortium. There are a few that do have a mix of English and French, but it's for the consortiums that are very widespread and are very, that have low um, numbers. Um, but the, the pattern across the province is that the larger boards, such as um, um, the Upper Canada Board, um, have just English at this point. Aquasonsky, we've not had any discussions, um, and I know that's a separate issue, and I know they, they maintain their own fleets. So the board there actually has uh, purchased their own uh, vehicles and uh, have had their own drivers. So it's not a, a third party contract with the driving service there. And there's been no discussion. Just to make it clear for me, Mr. Chairman, so no money is being spent in planning such coordinations of transportation. Go ahead. And uh, no. Any other comments or questions? Okay, great. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Cotman. It's good to have you back. And uh, we hope to make your, have you come back uh, through the year as part of our uh, cycle. And uh, is it still there? Uh, yeah, we don't trust the uh, directors, no. <laughs> No, that's not the case at all. Anyway, um, thanks very much uh, for um, Okay, Mr. Coombs, Ms. Allen, Superintendent Sup of School Operations, are you doing this together then? Or is uh, one doing it? Or? Mr. Chair, I'll take the lead, uh, but I will rely upon uh, Superintendent Allen to help me out in a couple of areas. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, recognize my slide deck is slightly over where it's supposed to be. <clears throat> I will say that, uh, number one, I will be concise with my presentation, and number two, I've already written a check to the c for k uh, to uh, accommodate that. Um, uh, trustees, you'll probably recognize this uh, um, chart from last year. It looks much the same. Um, there is a very large swath in yellow which makes up our instructional services and indeed um, approximately 90% of our school ops budget goes to uh, teachers uh, and salaries. Um, and so um, much of what I will uh, uh, give a brief uh, talk about tonight will be about that line um, and how we can try to realize some efficiencies going forward. Uh, of course, uh, our enrollment uh, drives our GSN, drives our um, funding. Uh, you will see um, in uh, the elementary, uh, we pretty much held the line from grades one to eight. Uh, of course, we see a large leap in, um, uh, in ELP and JKSK. Um, uh, so there's a large uh, uh, increase there. Um, and we are approximately at status quo in grades one to three and in four to eight with a slight decrease. That, of course, affects our funding. Uh, and you will see a, um, uh, a, uh, a uh, similar increase uh, based upon um, our enrollment. Uh, secondary, however, is has been mentioned already tonight, is still decreasing. Um, we are expecting in regular programs about a 4% decrease again uh, and a significant decrease in our TR Leger and alternative programming as well. Uh, that, of course, will uh, correspond in uh, lower funding going into next year. Um, this is a significant challenge for us because uh, in secondary enrollment, we do have uh, hard caps uh, in our schools. Uh, we have smaller classes, and we have increasing stress upon delivering program at these smaller schools. I did want to um, highlight, however, that uh, this money has bought us some of the smallest class sizes in the history of the province. And indeed, over the past five years, you can see where the class sizes have gone. They've either remained consistent uh, or they've slightly gone down. That includes grade 9 to 12, where our average class size is just over 19 kids. 
Um, while that is really nice to be able to say, uh, in smaller class, in smaller schools, it becomes um, an efficiency issue in our um, offering a full slate of programs, which I will talk about in a second. So what are our challenges? Well, um, I guess at the outset, our funding for secondary teachers does not meet our expenditures. We usually spend more in secondary teachers than we get from the ministry. Um, this is mainly because in elementary, we're funded for those hard caps. Uh, we are not funded for hard caps um, uh, in secondary. Uh, so we usually, um, uh, come September, because we have to meet uh, those uh, caps, uh, by the second week of September, we input more sections in, and those are teaching sections, um, and uh, we, uh, we pierce our affordability. Um, uh, and in our small high schools, uh, we get this perception that somehow we have limited programming, uh, and that we, um, I think that's a challenge that we need to uh, we need to address. There's also this perception that somehow e-learning or online learning is the second best or second rate, and uh, Associate Director Carswell mentioned that earlier. Um, actually, our day school online courses have a 91% success rate. I don't think we've been effective in addressing that or communicating that, and I will address that shortly as well. Um, and uh, again, we want to build public confidence that our schools can provide a full destination programming. Um, and our challenge is to optimize those resources to have engaging, relevant learning experience to all students, whomever they are, and more uh, importantly, wherever they may be. So this is our GS funding uh, versus annual expenditures in instructional services for secondary. So you can see um, that we try to hold the line as best we can. We try to be as efficient as possible. Um, uh, as our schools become smaller, that becomes an increasing challenge. Um, so you can see where we are uh, overspent, um, and although we do our best to hold the line, um, uh, we uh, uh, and we've been making certain inroads in this areas. Um, uh, we uh, we certainly this is an area that needs to be addressed. I'm going to talk about e-learning, and I'm glad that it was mentioned earlier. Um, I want to differentiate between continuing education, online learning, and day school online learning. Continuing education learning are the um, distance ed courses. It's when you have a marker, but you don't necessarily have a teacher. In fact, you don't have a teacher. Success rates for our kids in that are 41%. They're more than double when you have a teacher in an e-learning environment. Um, and I, I think we need to distinguish. Oftentimes, we'll get um, uh, parents who will complain about an e-learning experience, and what they're really talking about is continuing education, not an e-learning day school um, experience. Mm -hmm. So um, we have been increasing our course offerings um, and growing the capacity of our online teachers. Uh, one of our program administrators, Matt Robinson, has been key uh, in helping us with this. Um, just to look at our uh, load efficiency in day school online, you can see uh, a few years ago we had 15 courses. We raised that to 21. And last year we made a leap to 34. Next year we're projecting 46. But what's really important is that um, our efficiency load, and that means the number of kids that are actually in the courses up to the cap have increased as well. So this year, we're almost at 96% efficiency. That means up to the maximum we can have, we have very few empty spaces in e-learning. So more kids are both selecting that option, and as you'll see, more kids are being successful in that option. Um, I'm going to skip ahead really quickly just so I can um, uh, address Aboriginal education as well. Um, the reason why I highlighted Aboriginal education, and, and I have um, uh, you and McIntosh here with Romaine Mitchell has been really key in moving us forward in this. Um, we've been increasing our Aboriginal education Native Studies courses and classes so that every school in our board has at least one, and in some cases multiple, Native Studies courses. The key for that is that those Native Studies courses are revenue generating. So every non-Aboriginal student who takes a Native Studies course generates over $1,200 of revenue. And you can see in this next slide uh, that as our credits increase, so the blue lines are funding, um, uh, our funding increases with pupil credits. Uh, and so you can see considerable revenue is generated by these students taking Native Studies. However, I would also say that they're also getting a really quality experience in getting a side of Canadian history and art that perhaps has been neglected in past years. 
Our key tactics going forward, um, we are going to be increasing the number of online um, uh, courses available. Uh, we have a UCDSB online calendar that will be released in December of 2014. That means for the first time, students can select by intention, not necessarily by default, an online course. Uh, we have more training being rolled out for our online teachers, greater capacity. Um, great teaching is great teaching, regardless of whether it's online or in front of kids. And we find that our, uh, our online teachers are becoming much more adept at engaging students. Um, we're also interested in developing UCDSB only online niche courses. And I just want to explain that really briefly. So there are some courses which and as Associate Director Cardswell mentioned, if we leverage the size of our board, we have over 9,000 secondary students, we can offer courses in virtually anything if we make it really engaging in an online experience. One of the things we're looking at is a writing course that's for online publishing, where students get to creatively write and sell their works on Amazon uh, or Indigo. So the, the really exciting things going on there. Um, we also see the leveraging our new families of schools organization to create closer ties between Alted, which is TR Leger, and the day school uh, support um, student programming. Um, and I'm going to skip back to our TR Leger slides here. The main challenge for TR Leger is distance. Um, in an urban setting, you can have one alternative education site, and it's very easy to bring students in. As you can see, it becomes more difficult. Uh, and we have to have multiple campuses, 17, across our uh, jurisdictions. Um, it is, however, our largest school. Uh, and you can see um, that our enrollment uh, in both over 21 uh, and under 21 uh, makes it the largest school in eastern Ontario. In fact, we'll have more than 400 graduates in the next uh, uh, few days at TR Leger graduations across, um, across the uh, eastern Ontario. Um, so, uh, working with Jeff Tarasik and his administration team, uh, we are looking at improving both the relationship with the day school within that family of school setting, as well as uh, increasing ownership of the day school even when the child goes to, or the student goes to TR Leger, um, and tracking that student when they go to TR Leger, uh, and also in increasing the number of, of, um, of hours so those students are counted as full-time students. Um, our performance indicators, um, uh, we are going to be looking very closely at our class load efficiency in all classes, especially our e-learning. Um, certainly student achievement and looking at comparative data both in e-learning and day school. Um, the student satisfaction indicators, for the first time we're actually going to look at student satisfaction of the e-learning experience. We haven't done that before, but it's high time that we did. Um, and we need to look at, um, um, uh, of course, continually look at our funding versus expenditure. Of course, we depend very closely upon Michael and Nancy to assist us as we go forward. Um, so I will never put a section or Val will never put a teacher into an elementary school without understanding its impact upon um, uh, our financial outlook. And our key results we're really looking at, closing that gap between teacher funding and expenditure, especially in the secondary line, uh, increasing student and parent confidence and the ability of our small schools to create, um, uh, to deliver full destination programming um, and certainly to increase student engagement through increased program choice and increased teacher capacity. So we'll be able to have, we believe, students, no matter where they are, select the program that best fits their needs and their destination and that we're quite excited about. Not sure if I stayed under 10 minutes. No. I'm sorry about that, but I'm happy to take it. Okay, you're definitely under uh, the superintendent of business. She has the record. Yes, or I'm figuring out how this is going to work. Trustee McDonald. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions, but I will respect uh, the chair. I know there's probably a few others who want to ask questions. So just going, starting at the beginning, you slide one, total operations. Similar slide to last year, more color and numbers. I like it. Yes. That's important to understand what piece of the pie uh, it represents, but the, the dollar value associated to it. When I look at, um, uh, and then move into just quickly on class size for a second. We talk about small schools. We talk about how we operate within, <coughs> within our, our board. Um, 
in, in class size, when you report, we report an average class size, is that correct? Um, and, and you allocate funds associated to school needs. One of the, one of the things that um, faces me as a trustee for the City of Cornwall, the challenges that I have is that because I have um, larger schools <coughs> in the City of Cornwall, I would say that the needs of the, the students in the City of Cornwall are somewhat higher than, than others. It's always challenging to help offset some of those challenges that we have uh, when we have other resources that have to be allocated across the board. And then when typically our larger schools tend to have those larger class sizes. So what are we going to do to help the schools that have the larger enrollment, that have the larger class sizes, but still have those needs that, that have to be there? So how are we gonna help my schools, I guess, moving forward? Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, one of the things that we do every year, um, right around this time actually, uh, is uh, we ask our uh, secondary principals to give us a uh, update of their timetable in response to their timetable in progress. So um, over the past couple of months, they've been building through their staffing what their timetable is going to look like. And what I ask for are their pressure points. So I say, where do you feel that you're going to have some issues come September? Um, and so if I can use an example of Cornwall Collegiate, um, I know one of their issues is um, with their workplace destination courses. So they say, you know, and, and um, uh, workplace destination courses have a cap of 15 on them. So that actually, if you have 17 students, uh, does that mean two students just don't get to take workplace? So I like to know that now so that we can start um, aligning our resources for the fall. Um, so one of the ways we help out is that I, I will know by the end of this month, um, in the next couple of weeks, really what we're looking at in the, in the fall and where those issues are going to be. Um, I, I, I want to come back just as a key tactic that online learning. Um, what we really believe is that if we give kids a choice up front rather than by um, uh, whether they can intentionally select courses that are online, that includes English for a, a regular day school course that they might take in the, in the day school. Um, we believe that it's going to alleviate some of the stress on some of our all our schools uh, and allow principals then to, to um, apply the staffing to the greatest need. Um, so if they know up front, before they're building their staffing, what courses are going to be filled in online and what students are going to be, what their needs are going to be, they're going to be able to better address them. Mr. McMillan. Through you, Chair. Uh, Superintendent Coombs, I'm going back to slide two. And I'm really pleased to see that we're spending a lot of, giving a lot of attention to e-learning and we're, we're going to you know, look at see some key performance indicators to look at the effect of this, all that. I don't see on slide two where costing comes in for e-learning. Where does it fit in here? And if so, what does e-learning cost us? Go Thank ahead. you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's um, actually out of instructional services. So I, um, uh, earlier in the year, I would get an affordability of how many secondary teachers we can afford. And then I would apportion those to schools and I would hold back sections which would be for e-learning. So those sections are taken out of instructional services. Um, however, it's important to note um, that I can't pull teachers out and hold them centrally. I have to allocate those into schools. So those teachers that are teaching our e-learning, they're also teaching day school in our, in, our, uh, in our classes. So when we increase to 46, um, that's coming from instructional services, but it'll have greater efficiency. So instead of sitting in front of 18 kids teaching uh, grade 12 history, they're teaching 26 students, and those students could be from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, for you, Chair. So I understand the personnel costs. Is there are there any other costs attached to e-learning other than just personnel? Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you. Um, sorry. Yes, uh, there are costs. We are funded for. Um, we do have funding for Matthew Robinson, who is our e-learning coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, we have funding for professional development. Um, so we bring e-learning teachers together. We help build their capacity with a desire to learn platform um, and other associated costs. So yes, uh, if I may add also, we're uh, also budgeting for a e-learning registrar for next year. Um, uh, Matt, while he is a uh, uh, very quick on the keyboard, I think his time would be better used actually building capacity of our teachers rather than inputting data into a system. Um, and so that's one of the ways we're gonna help free up time for him 
to better apply it uh, his resources in, in building teacher capacity. And so this is really so the infrastructure itself, the setting up of the course themselves, are basically insignificant in terms of funds. Uh, the actual you, program that the kids are working on. Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, it's uh, actually the Desire to Learn platform um, is uh, is created by the ministry. Um, it's uh, uh, it provided to us, um, uh, and um, it's actually a, a a really dynamic platform that all teachers can access. And I really want to point that out, actually. We want to increase the capacity of all our teachers to put content online so that they can start blending their learning. And this perhaps is, goes more into the program area, um, but blended learning is a model that we think will benefit all kids, no matter whether they're taking day school or evening. Thank you. Christy McAllister. Dave, you uh, mentioned improved uh, e-teachers. Due to inactivity in your conference, this call will be terminated unless you press the digit one on your telephone. You mentioned improved e-teacher and student efficacy learning through a different medium. How and uh, what exactly does that mean? Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had mentioned that good teaching is good teaching and engaging teaching is just good engaging teaching. Um, I think one of the things we're finding is the teachers that are being successful, that are having the highest success rates and are being very popular, are those teachers that are able to engage and reach out to kids on an ongoing basis and do a lot of um, formative assessment. So instead of, they're not just marking courses that kids submit online, that's rather boring. What they're doing is they're responding to kids. They're creating online forums, chat rooms, where kids can get together and gather in a community, albeit an online community, where they can start talking about assignments, ideas, concepts, and sharing, uh, and even doing online projects. So a student in Bankley Hill can combine with a student in Athens and actually share a program and submit it for marking. But we find that the teachers who are very comfortable in that um, have the greatest success. So what we also do is one of our strategies is on a year-to-year -year basis, we ensure that those teachers have had the greatest success are teaching e-learning on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Trustee McRae. Um, through you, Chair. I was very, very happy to see um, the information on our first, uh, on Pierre Leger and also our First Nation Act and the programs that you're developing. Um, I noticed that uh, the TR um, Leger uh, enrollment head counts are going, are, are decreasing although we're having more uh, graduates uh, across the stage. What are we doing to build capacity um, in the area of TR Leisure to ensure that we're getting more engaging, more students in those courses? Go ahead. Thank you for you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for that question. Um, one of the things that we are, um, uh, I think that uh, Principal Tarasic and his staff are working on is getting away from the 20 lesson pen and paper handed in uh, with very minimal engagement. So if you go to a TR Leger site now, you will see a lot of kids working on um, uh, collaborative projects, for example. Um, and we still provide that for the student who wants to come in. I, look, I just want to sit in quietly and I want to do my work and I'm going to submit it. Um, we are now engaging them more in, 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 um, uh, in, in group work, uh, in, in taking lessons and making them engaging <coughs> and making them relevant. So if I can give you one really quick example, um, uh, we've been working on a literacy uh, um, a project uh, throughout our secondary schools, and of course is also TR Leger. We have teachers who take the grade 10 curriculum, and instead of uh, looking at poetry that's in, the, um, that's in the curriculum, they start making it into songs. So they, this one particular student really likes country western. So he's created a project around country and western music. He, that teacher uh, adapted that curriculum and made it relevant to that student. That student then has more success based upon that. So that's an ongoing literacy issue, but that's also going throughout uh, TR Leger. It is a process that takes time. This is a change in culture for a lot of the teachers who have been at TR Leger, but certainly Principal Tarasic is moving in that direction. We're fully supporting. Trustee McAllister, we'll come back to you, Trustee McCray. Thank you. Um, Dave, I don't see any mention uh, for mental health and wellness and the implementation of a Living Well um, plan for the board. Uh, where is it found? 
in your budget presentation. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, if you see the other projects, um, the mm -hmm. line 1.2 million, um, mental health and wellness is in there as well as safe schools. Um, and um, I know Superintendent Allen, if you would like to add to that. Well, that's exactly right. It's in the operations of through those special projects. And um, if I could add a lot of a lot of the funding this year for that is an EPO grant. So that's sort of outside of our budget. It's money that is given to us by the province. Thank you. Uh, Trustee McDonald. Thank you. Um, so this slide here in particular gives me numbers, but uh, I'd have to sit here with a calculator and figure out what the overall budget is. And we have online learning in, in embedded in something in here. And you mentioned to me that you were to us that you're going to hire a new person. So are we finding new money? Are we adding money to the budget? Are you reallocating resources? And is what else are we doing? Uh, in, 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 I apologize, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, it was. I submitted an app, um, a request for a registrar, and this is a incremental expense. So, perhaps I could uh, ask Superintendent Barkley to expand on that. Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the, the that was a request that was added to the budget as an operating expense. And it's it's new for fourteen fifty. What else is new, uh, Mr. Chair? Through you, um, as far as I know, that's the only um, that's the only addition to this line, uh, to the ops budget. Um, and I apologize for not giving you a cumulative. It's one hundred and seventy three million dollars between the lines. There's another one, but I'll wait if you want to go on. Uh, Trustee McCray. Through you, Chair. I remember at one time we were talking about TR Measure and um, um, I, I believe there was a motion that uh, we were going to be doing a review. I also remember our Chair making a statement that um, TR Measure, uh, in terms of uh, hoping to generate additional revenues, um, there might be some opportunities. Moving forward with TR Leger and into this budget year, do you see opportunities to generate additional revenues by um, paying the rent? Um, I, I don't really know what he meant by opportunities. Maybe. I think I was actually referring to uh, UCLC. Okay. So that's a different different side, but a different like that's the. Um, International ed and that whole piece there, piece that Tim Mills talked about last time. So are, in this budget, are we at all looking at that as a way to generate additional revenue for TR Leger? Uh, no, because the money wouldn't necessarily go to TR Leger. It could come back to us in the form of, well, it does come back to us in the form of uh, um, they do pay the equivalent for. Um, for a student, so they pay twelve thousand or whatever it is, whatever the student cost is. Um, but inside the TR, uh, the UCLC budget, they also embark upon projects. For instance, uh, doing English language instruction for um, the um, tra traffic control school that's run out of um, Cornwall, mm -hmm. and other projects like that. So they generate funds to do that. And part of those funds right now are being used to run our um, summer program. What's that called? Ready for summer. Ready for summer. So they, that, that's currently what it does. But there are other opportunities in there that if they increase their revenues, that they could fund other programs too. But that's that doesn't sh that only shows up in this budget under the revenue line where you would calculate those students right you've included that in the revenue superintendent Barkley I think the last when we asked for the revenue statement you showed the international students coming through the revenue line yes. Yes. so they are exactly. that amounts already in here okay. Thank you. Uh, trustee McPherson Sorry. Um, 
moving on a wee bit. Um, I'm just curious. Um, not all instructional services take place within a school setting. Um, and I realize there's probably no piece of the pie here for co-op education. And essentially that is, I won't use the word revenue, but certainly teaching services delivered by an outside body, namely the co-op placement. But just whereabouts on the pie would that fall into? And I know it's not a not a black and white in and out thing um, through the chair. Thank you, Mr. So Harris. Um, co-op uh, would be in, would be in, in under instructional services, and in that the co-op teachers would come out of that line. Um, there is uh, some support for mileage when it comes to students who have to travel to uh, their co-op placements, but other than that, it would come out of the teaching line. Okay. Trustee McMillan? Through you, Chair. I'm, I'm not sure who I want to ask this question, so I'm going to start with Nancy and we'll go from there. Just listening to some of the discussion tonight, it appears, and I could be all wrong on this, that there are other sources of money that come in that doesn't necessarily show up in the budget. Is that true or is that not true? And the reason I say that is that, you know, the Associate Director Carswell mentioned the million, but he has to start with 90, but there were other sources of money that came in. Are there pockets of money that come in that the, the we as a board of trustees don't see in the budget itself? Go ahead. I'm just, I, I don't know. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there are other, are other pockets of revenue that come in. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at here tonight are, so far, are the budgeted expenses. Uh, some examples of other revenue you have heard about, obviously, the GSNs and the uh, EPO grants that come mm -hmm. in. Uh, there are also some federal grants and fees. Those are mainly through the TR Leger uh, group. Uh, we have investment income that we earn on our bank account. Um, there's some revenue from other school boards. Specifically, it's really one school board who rents some space from us. Um, there are, of course, the tuition fees that come to us from the Upper Panda Learning Center, uh, tuition fees from the Akwesasne Board, um, and there are, there are school generated funds, but they are very specific to be used in schools for those purposes. Thank you. Mr. Buckland? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the hockey schools and uh, how we rate the, uh, the equivalent funding and uh, academic <laughs> credit in the Rockland one. And the second part is, uh, are there any equivalency credits uh, offered from the, uh, the Cornwall one, the CHA, is it called, Dave, the Cornwall Hockey Academy or something like that? Go ahead. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, I guess to your second question, no, we don't have a relationship with the Cornwall Hockey School. Um, however, the uh, um, Rockland <coughs> Hockey School would be a revenue neutral proposition. So we would, um, that would, uh, uh, we would uh, receive tuition to pay for instructional services to the Rockland Hockey School. Trustee McDonald. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Coombs, I just want to go back to the last slide. I think it's your last slide, anyways. Yeah, key results. Um, you have four key results here. Close the gap, increase student parent confidence, increase student engagement, final enrollment data. When I look at the middle two in particular right now, let's jump out at me. How are you going to measure that? What's your baseline today, and what are you going to measure it against moving forward? How are you going to know whether you're successful or not? <coughs> Thank you for you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, that, uh, we, that's a very good question in that we don't have a baseline right now. Um, so um, right now, our, um, our baseline would be perceptual data. Um, what we need to do is we need to be able to um, develop a measure that can actually give us some uh, evidence that um, of, uh, of uh, both parent and student satisfaction. Um, so part of this is, you know, I, I, I spoke earlier regarding a, um, a student satisfaction survey regarding uh, our e-learning. Um, you see that. Uh, as being a key piece of gathering data and saying, if you've had a good experience in this, if you're satisfied with this experience, 
Um, the, there really is nothing that we can't offer um, across our entire board. Um, I think the increased <coughs> student engagement, um, uh, you know, our Tell Them For Me survey measures student engagement. I'm not sure if that's going to get us the kind of data specific to that. Um, I think our vision is that every student can make um, selections every year. When students fill out their selection form, they usually select eight courses, and then there are three blanks where they can select alternatives. So if I don't get my eight choices, I, I can take those. Those are my defaults. We're wondering why can't we say, if you are flexible in how you take your courses, why can't you get those eight courses? So I guess my question would be, I think we can track how many students are getting the courses they want at first um, uh, uh, at first blush? So they're not going to their second or third or fourth choice. And quite frankly, um, there are a lot of our students who are taking courses that they really didn't want to take, but it's only one available to them. So how can we increase their ability to get the course they want when they want it? Um, and those two will be key measurements that we need to, to, uh, to see if we're being successful. I think a big part of that third one especially is saying, <coughs> did you get the courses you requested? Did you get the courses you wanted? Are you in those courses? So um, both those two measures I think will be important to move forward. And this time next year, what I hope to do is be able to report and say, here's where we are with those. Through you, Chair. Yeah, I'll come to you in just a second, Trustee Swan. Trustee uh, McDonald. So on, on, I guess to that point, if we, if we, are in the evaluation stage of the measurement aspect. Do you anticipate having that measurement? I guess the conclusion is how you're going to measure it um, relatively soon, so that your strategies are based on how you're doing that, or do you have strategies in place, and then are going to develop your measurements based on your strategies? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, uh, I would agree that right now we have strategies in place, and we're basing some of. The, well, we're basing. Um, uh, certainly the uh, the first measure and the final measure on our current, we have current data for that. We don't have data, uh, we have perceptual data on two and three. So right now we're, we're um, acting upon a strategy which we believe to be true. We have to test that out next year, you're quite right. Um, so we do have to develop measures to see if our strategy has been effective or not. Can I just, uh, I'm gonna go to Trustee Swan next and I'll come back to you, Trustee. Just to remind you uh, that currently you're coming back to see us um, October, -ish, November. -ish. This time next year is coming faster than you think. <laughs> Trustee Swan. Trustee Swan. Trustee McDonald. Go ahead. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. She muted or we muted? I can hear you, uh, Trustee uh, Swan. All right, I'll come back to you in a second. Trustee. Through you, Chair? Yep, go ahead. Trustee well. McDonald, go ahead. Um, turn off my thing here. Uh, if I go back to um, to the comment, as we're moving forward, we have a strategy in place and measure for it. How do we know that this is something that we need to tackle, I guess, if we're developing a strategy first and, and trying to, to fine tune things as we move forward? Thank go you. Ahead. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I think er earlier in the year, this would have been in the fall, um, I gathered a team together and they were a program people as well as secondary principals and we talked about some of the struggles we had with small schools um, and that um, their feedback to us um, was that they were having a really difficult time in offering A, full programming uh, and B, um, that they were having difficulty with students that were in courses that they really didn't want to take. Uh, we also received feedback from guidance counselors of the same, um, same again this is perceptual data um, uh, but we asked the question: What if we could, um, uh, what if we could get students, or what if we could promise students um, that what you, what your first selections were, 
we're going to be um, uh, we're going to be honored that you'd be able to access all of them, if not uh, most of them, if not all. Um, so that really came out of that conversation, that talking with principals, talking with guidance counselors, getting their feedback, and and recognizing also that we're not out of our declining enrollment in secondary yet. It's going to go forward at least another couple of years, um, and that. Um, you know, this, this was going to be an increasingly difficult issue um, and that we needed to develop strategies that would help address this. Um, and so I guess it came out of that need. It also came out of the fact that we did, you know, the investigation into some of our class loads. I can give an example. In, in our grade 12 university English in second semester is loading at a 45% currently. So we started looking at that kind of data saying that's really inefficient. Um, and uh, that's costing us, A, it's costing us money, and it's money that draws from elsewhere, and, and B, um, uh, you know, I, we, we believe that we can offer more programming uh, to our students, especially in our small schools. And I think there's increasing questions about our small schools with the viability of our small schools. We think any school can be viable. RO has 146 students next year. Athens might have 180. Um, we think that all schools can be viable if we um, uh, if we use strategies that a leverage our um, uh, the size of our uh, of our entire board, um, uh, promote e-learning and the desire to learn platform, um, and also uh, uh, give more tools to our guidance counselors and principals. Okay, then I think we're going to move on. Okay. So get it all in now. Is that what you're saying? Get it in now. Make sure the last one your best one. Uh, so, and I can appreciate that. My, I guess my worry is, in light of what we've discussed previously as a group of trustees, and you know we've had individuals come in and talk to us about data. I think I, I my myself personally, and I hope the rest of the trustees would support this. That we want to move away from perceptual, uh, perceptual data and, and or perception based decisions, and move more into the the, the data decisions. If we have data, as you, you've indicated, we've got a 40, uh, 45 percent loading of our grade 12, that's a problem. We know it's a problem. So that's something that we can support by data and how do we dig down to it? What's the root cause analysis to that? Rather than having a perception to say, I think it's this, I think it's that. If we ask the five whys and get down to the root cause, then we can attack something and invest dollars into into, into uh, what we believe. And, I, and I'm hopeful that as we move forward with this the progression of the uh, um, of the budget process that we have those, those types of, uh, of discussions. You know, it leads in back into um, Superintendent uh, Carswell, Associate Superintendent Carswell, uh, sorry, Associate Director uh, Carswell. You know, prototyping, I, I'm supportive of it, but I want to make sure that we're prototyping based on, on good data as opposed to perception because then, then we have, we know we're solving a problem. We're not trying to solve something we think may be a problem or maybe reinventing or inventing a problem. I think if I go, if I just look at number two on this one, I mean, one thing that stuff jumps out to me is if we want to increase student and parent confidence, you know, baseline data for me is our enrollment. If our enrollment today is this, and, and, and I've said it before, we have the capacity to be able to have all of the students in Eastern Ontario come to our school. We have the ability to do that. No other board does. So if our enrollment today is whatever, and our market share is whatever, we have a declining birth rate in Canada. Declining enrollment should be, in my view, mixed from our, our vocabulary. Declining birth rate is, is a reality, but we still have a group of children that, out there that are able to come to us, and their confidence in us is done by voting with their feet when they come to our schools. And really that, you know, what you're doing here requires the use and the systems of other departments. It requires the communication department. It requires, so to me, if we, if we identify that as an issue, um, problem, because we think we should have more students, then your work and others will certainly achieve what we're, what we're looking for. The baseline data is our enrollment today. What do we do to support um, something moving forward and next year has it improved? Um, and I just I, thought, I hope that as we as we progress through these discussions that we have the opportunity to have that, that type of information. Then we have an opportunity as, as a group of trustees to have that mm -hmm decision-making process to say, is it high dollar and high impact? Or is it you know, high dollar and low impact? Because when the funds are, are being squeezed, 
and potentially will be squeezed um, as, as a new government comes into place. Regardless of who it is, uh, funds will be tighter. So our resources have to be allocated with the highest impact possible. So I'm hopeful that when we see that moving forward, we'll be able to, to have those discussions and see that data. So thank you. Okay, I'm good with that. That's a good last statement. Um, so I'm gonna move on now. I think you're still up, so don't go far. Are you sure? Yep, go ahead. One last comment or question. It is, uh, we are very much um, succeeding on trying to achieve the 90% enroll um, graduation rate. But my question is, what are we really doing and where is our money really being spent to help these students to achieve to the higher potentials other than just graduating from the Upper Canada District School Board? Anybody want to take a shot at answering that? So I think that probably centers around the, you know, like the 90% graduation rate is a target. But our mission, which I think in an organization is almost more important because it's a more lengthy, is to prepare students for a successful life. So I would hope that the system sees that that's more than just the 90% graduation rate. That's making sure that their character is, uh, is uh, robust, uh, that they have a variety of opportunities, whether that's through the arts or, or through um, uh, sports, um, that really that we, uh, when, a, when a student graduates from us, that it is far more than, than just a high school diploma, that we have actually set them up to explore their future and really uh, pursue that, that successful life that I think that as parents we want for our kids and I think as a school board uh, we try to achieve. Anyone want to add to that? I think the money part of it I think is more, you know, like the, the strategic objectives of the board are to get to a 90% graduation rate and, and that is that's sort of our overarching goal. But I think when you peel back the layers, and at one time we used to have three goals sitting there. One of them was the Michelangelo, and we kind of looked at that as really a tool to get to the goal. But I, I think there's a lot more um, to what we do, and I would point to, to the mission statement as well. All right, uh, Mr. Coons, Alternative and Continuing Education. And I'm going to uh, give you about two minutes. That's good, Mr. Chair, because I um, actually rolled that into my previous. <laughs> I thought so, so I didn't. We don't need to cover that. Okay. <laughs> 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 yes. All right. Does somebody else need more time? Because we've got some bonus time now. Oh. All right, uh, Superintendent Barkley, you want to uh, finish up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, you have two minutes. pardon? You have two minutes. Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go quickly. Again, I'm pleased to bring forth tonight a proposed uh, compliant budget for 2014-15. Uh, the format of the presentation that you're about to see is similar to what you've seen in in. Uh, past years, or at least this board has seen in past years. Um, many of the details were provided in your package, and uh, so this presentation is going to focus only on the high-level numbers. Uh, as well, before I start, uh, I don't have a slide on this, but in the annotated technical paper, uh, you may have noticed that we have the page on enrollment and showing the enrollment change by category. And because this year, 14-15, uh, because of the rolling in to the GSNs of the full day kindergarten funding, um, we uh, provided a supplementary analysis in that technical paper just to show you the impact of our enrollment or what our impact would have been 
had those full day kindergarten students not been rolled in, so that extra 0.5. So similarly, when you're looking at your package and all of the appendices in it, uh, you will see an Appendix B that actually shows a 3.9% increase in enrollment from 13-14. Again, that is because of that one half of the uh, kindergarten students being rolled in. If you were to remove that impact, uh, we would actually be uh, seeing a 2.3% decline <coughs> compared to 13-14. So now we'll move on to, to the dollars. So the first slide shows the projected revenue for 14-15. Can I? Sorry? I mean, can I just, sorry to interrupt you. I know you probably have something that you want to get through, but I think that trustees, are we good with the revenue statement here? Unless there's something really, that there's something that we need to focus in on, uh, Nancy. What I think that we should, uh, I'd like you to focus in on is the compliance calculation. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're primarily interested in. I think we, we get the revenue. Um, I can do that. If you don't mind, I'm just, so just for the sake of time. Okay. So anybody object to that? No. Okay. So we have the um, the comparison statement of operations. So you have that, and we give that as read. So if we can just go to the compliance calculation and look at how we're going to handle the in-year deficit of three million dollars. Okay. So start. Through you, Mr. Chair, on this slide, slide yeah, four. That's correct. Okay. So that uh, at the top shows the revenues that were shown earlier on earlier slides. And then we need to eliminate uh, school generated funds revenue from that, which is what we do every year. Uh, something a little different this year the 4.2 million that you see there is the revenue for the land uh, for the new school in Kempville. And the ministry brought that revenue into, into operating. We have to remove it for uh, compliance purposes. So that results in revenue for compliance purposes of 346.9 million. Then we move down to our uh, operating expenses. Uh, this will look familiar, I believe. We need to adjust for compliance. And uh, the main component here is to add back that cost uh, that we have to um, amortize or fund over the nine years for our employee future benefits. And as well, uh, we eliminate again the school generated fund expenses. So yes, in fact, uh, although on the previous page we had a uh, $5.4 million surplus, that brings us to a $3 million deficit which is within the compliance threshold of the ministry. However, the next slide will put this in a different light. So there at the top is the $3 million deficit. Uh, when, um, when we were here in um, November and then, or December and then again in January, we talked about and committed to incorporating an enrollment contingency into the 14-15 budget. So in this, in these expenses uh, is the equivalent of about 100 ADE, and those expenses have not been allocated to any other purpose. So if enrollment comes in at least at the projected level, then the $907,000 that you see there uh, will we'll reduce the deficit as long as those dollars are not spent elsewhere. So that brings us down to a $2.1 million deficit. The other expense that we have in 1415 is $1.8 million for our computer upgrade project. Now, normally that would be $2.7 million every three years. Uh, because of our dollars here, we have a strategy that if we need to, we will spend $1.8 million at the end of 14-15, so receive those computers into our possession at, at the end of August, 
and then we will receive the other 900,000 early in 1516. The reason I'm showing this is because if you look down at the bottom part in the arrow that's going up, we already generated surplus in prior years in anticipation of this large computer purchase, which was in or is sitting in our accumulated surplus. In the olden days, we could have put that money into reserves, we could have brought it into revenue in year, and it would not have impacted the bottom line in terms of creating an in-year deficit. So the, if we take into account that the 1.8 million was already appropriated, intended to fund the large computer purchase, that in effect brings us down to an adjusted deficit of about $300,000. So going ahead to what we, in finance, call Schedule 5, this is our accumulated surplus deficit. It's really the equity uh, portion of the balance sheet. Uh, if we go to the very bottom, and I'm looking at the second column from the right, that is where we see that in-year generated surplus. And then if you work your way up through that column, you will see, again, all of those adjustments that are required for compliance purposes, bringing us up again to that $3 million negative number uh, in the amount available for compliance row. Then as we move up from there, I'll draw your attention to the line, it doesn't show on the screen, but it's actually line four, which is the computer upgrade project where we had put aside 1.8 million dollars and there the plan in 1415 is then to use that surplus to fund those computers so you see that going away and then moving on up to the top what that does is it leaves an impact on our uh, unappropriated accumulated surplus what used to be called our working funds a decrease of 1.2 million now, that number will be different if the enrollment comes in at least where it's projected. Um, so the only, the caution here is that our unappropriated surplus is being eroded um, and we won't be able to do, to sustain that uh, going forward. Uh, however, uh, it still results in a compliant budget. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. So, so as I said, the budget's compliant, and it will evolve and change uh, in the months ahead. Um, it will be fine-tuned in the fall again once we know our enrollment, uh, which is, of course, the key driver of our funding. Um, but in future years going forward, it is anticipated that um, we'll be further impacted by you know, the declining birth rate, uh, declining enrollment in our secondary schools in the secondary panel. As well, there is the concern of the province's financial situation and what that may mean for us in the future. Um, so certainly, um, we have some long-term planning to do. Uh, we need to keep any um, adverse uh, effects away from the, school, the schools as much as we can. And uh, we'll continue to strive to anticipate what's coming and uh, approach the issues uh, collaboratively uh, as they arise. Mr. McAllister? I've always had trouble with the, uh, the issue of compliant budgets using a, a deficit. But uh, nevertheless, uh, if uh, the inappropriate, unappropriated surplus is under stress, as you say, using it in the future is going to mean that it's going to be more and more difficult to reach a compliant budget. Through you, Chair. The uh, accumulated surplus, based on the formula that is looked at as being available for compliance, is actually um, about the middle of the screen, projected to be $4.9 million by the end of 1450. 
that is the ministry, uh, th that's what the ministry looks at as being available for compliance. However, we know that we have appropriated certain lines in there, for example, uh, school budget carry forwards, which we're anticipating will get back down to about that $1.5 million level. So as that $5 million or $4.9 million is there uh, for compliance, but what we really would like to use for compliance is that top line because that's, those are the funds that we haven't appropriated for any other specific purpose at this point. Mr. McDonald. Thank you. I, I want to pick up on what Trustee McAllister was, was saying. The, the appropriated is used for compliance, but it's, it's allocated money. It's reserves for specific purposes that we have. And if we don't use it for those purposes, it, we can't, can't move it. The cup money is in there to buy computers. It's not going to be used to offset declining enrollment, correct? Through you, Chair. The board has internally appropriated or planned for certain initiatives. However, when the ministry calculates to determine whether Upper Canada is compliant or not, it looks at the total accumulated surplus available for compliance, which includes those amounts that we have internally appropriated. Okay. So the mechanics of it, it, it does look at um, the top half of that screen. Fair enough, valid. However, the, the, the question comes back to, can we use $1.8 million that has been put aside for computers if we have a shortfall in enrollment to offset our expenses for teachers? Through you, Chair, if I'm understanding the question correctly, in this particular budget, we have allowed for enrollment to come in 100 ADE below the projections. Uh, so we would, if, if it comes in 100 below, we could still spend the 1.8 million. If, if enrollment comes in more than 100 below projections, then we have a challenge. Let me, let me rephrase it then. Okay. If we've allocated the money in, in an allocated surplus, do we have the luxury of using it anywhere that we want, regardless of what the, the reason is? Through you, Chair. Do you mean in the top half? Anywhere. Anywhere. An, an allocated surplus means that it's for a specific purpose. Can we change that purpose? Through you, Chair. I, I would need to confirm that, but I, I believe that the board um, makes the decision as to how, what to internally appropriate you could change that appropriation. For example, let's say we set aside the 1.8 million for the computers and then decided we weren't going to refresh our computers. You could reallocate that 1.8 million to, to something else. But to be absolutely sure, uh, I would need, need to check that. So, and, and that's what I need clarification on. From an appropriated standpoint, it gives us direction on what we are doing. So it would be similar to a specific reserve in the past mm -hmm. that we would have for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And is it a ministry requirement or is it a PSAB requirement that the reporting on, on uh, appropriated surpluses are done so? That we, I think we need the clarification if we can re reappropriate appropriated surpluses. Through you, Chair. Definitely the bottom half of that screen is externally appropriated, meaning we we must do that. It's not our decision, but the top half is an internal decision by the Board of Trustees. Fair enough. May I? Sure. I'll go to Trustee McPherson first, okay? Trustee McPherson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, basically, my interpretation of our strategy here is we are deferring a computer purchase as long as we can in the expectation that we might have to reallocate that money. It had been 
my hope to have seen a little more flexibility, a little more discretionary money here. Uh, thinking back to a few years ago when we had the ability to have a fund set aside for emerging needs, uh, addressing that uncertainty over our enrollment as the year rolls out. Unfortunately, I don't see that here. Um, uh, we have underestimated enrollment in the hope that we were wrong. But I would have been much more comfortable to see some sort of allocation for funding for emerging needs. Um, I'm a little nervous. We're kind of playing a shell game here. And I realize it's probably going to get worse before it gets better in the coming years. Trustee McPherson? Me? Sorry. Yeah. Trustee McDonald? So I think we're clear. We, we can get validation on that, on the appropriation of the funds. My concern on the um, surplus that's available for compliance is that we, we as a group, decide to put funds aside um, for specific purposes. And although they may be for compliance reasons, we can report them off. If we have the luxury of being able to pull it out when we have shortfalls, it's a bit of a, we're going to hurt ourselves somewhere else. So we plan for something, but yet we, we, we don't make other adjustments on a regular basis. So on the un unappropriated surplus, we're at 1.2 being pulled out. If we were to leave 1.2 million in the, one, in the unappropriated, it would be closer to $6 million. In, in a, Cumulative surplus. <coughs> wouldn't be compliant, correct? Excuse me, I didn't hear the last part. You so, if we leave the 1.2 in, it means that our um, cumulated surplus would be closer to six million dollars. So I'm not finished yet, so I'm going to mm -hmm. keep going. So, if that's at six million dollars, then we're not in compliance because we still have to deal with some of those issues. We would have to find 1.2 million dollars from our operating expenses. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. I need clarification. What do you mean by leaving the 1.2 in? Well, you're saying you're going to use, sorry. Oops. You're going to use 1.2 million of your accumulated surplus. Right. What if we didn't use it? Mr. Chair, this is what it would say given our projected budget we will need to use. I don't want to use it. Let, let's let's play the let's play the uh, the game here for a second. I don't want to use 1.2 million. If we have our projected budget, that means I've got to find 1.2 million in my expenses. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes, we could have. Excuse me, through you, Chair. If we didn't want to use 1.2 million dollars of our unappropriated surplus, then we would have had to find ways to reduce our expenses by 1.2 million. And from a, I think, Mr. Chair? Yep. From a financial perspective, do you think it's wise to play with the surplus or to try and watch our expenses as we move forward in the current year? Is there anything we can do to watch our expenses and allow the surplus to remain? To you, Chair? Certainly, we could go back and revisit expenses. Uh, however, there, the enrollment contingency is in there. Whether that will, whether our enrollment will come in lower than projections, is anybody's guess. But uh, it's probably not all that likely. Um, we, the the other thing to keep in mind is that the opening balance is also projected of our accumulated surplus unappropriated. We won't know what that is for sure until we do our financial statements. So that is also a projected number. I can tell you in here that uh, when we did our projections on revenue for international students, uh, <coughs> since then there is a thought that there will be actually more students than that but we did not change our revenue projection for that. 
do I think it's wise to keep doing this? No. Um, I would personally, my own opinion is I would feel better if that first line had at least a $3 million balance, which is 1% approximately um, that the ministry uses for the compliance, compliance threshold. So if per chance in a year we did have a bad year, we had a $3 million deficit, we would have that, that money to cover. But certainly, um, we cannot continue to erode our accumulated surplus forever. Well, we should, we really, like I, I, I'm assuming going forward, we need to do more than just say to budget holders, you're going to have a 1.9% decrease in your budget line, right, to try to get to this. We're going to have to have a, uh, a bigger strategy or a more in-depth look, because I don't, I mean, one week before, or two weeks before we have to pass the budget in order to meet the expectations of the ministry is is a tough time to be trying to do this mm -hmm. but um, we're gonna need to sit down and, and have a long-term strat long-term think about this mm -hmm. and because next year you, you could come back and you could do the same thing again roughly and then there'd be zero and I don't think we want to get there, right? So I know that at this end of the table, we've often taught or thought, discussed, not necessarily here, but amongst ourselves that do we have to set a target and provide some direction that we expect that this does get up to be, you know, point eight percent of the overall budget um, or have you guys already sat down and mapped out a plan on how this is going to be handled I mean I don't think I'm not seeing any indication that that's in that that was anywhere in what we talked about but I guess the answer to that is no question McDonald do yeah I just wanted to say and to your point I think it's important for us I don't believe we have enough information for right now to be able to say I'd rather take 1.2 million dollars out of our expenses and allow the the surplus to remain. And the reason I say we don't have that is because we don't we haven't received the information. I don't know what all the expenses are. I don't know what if each department is going to do different from one year to the next. We've got some some departments that are very very specific on how they were presenting the information to us and what I spent last year and what they're going to spend this year. We haven't got that across the board. And, and tonight, and two weeks prior to, to us trying to, to uh, uh, pass a budget, again, we're in a situation where we're going to um, uh, unknowingly spend at least $1.2 million to achieve something we're not sure of. Because we haven't got enough detail, in my view, to be able to say we're making the right decision to offset the lower revenue that we have with higher expenses. I'm not sure that I have enough information. I don't have enough confidence to say we're doing the right things. However, this late in the game, this is the only thing we have left. We're playing with our destiny here. Every year that we come forward and we whittle away at a surplus, we're playing with our destiny. We're playing with our capability to make sure that we have those world-class programs to be able to entice students into us. I think the program that we have in place is going to make sure that we have an understanding of what those expenses are moving forward. Tonight, we're not going to solve that. We're not going to boil the ocean. But I, I am frustrated that we're forced to dip into the reserves, the or, uh, unappropriated surplus, to be able to offset something that I'm really not sure what we're going to spend it on. You know, making sure that we move this process forward is going to ensure that we have that peace in, of, of mind come next year. 
Like, here's what we plan on spending. Here's what our revenues are. What's the delta? Let's let's talk about it. We can't do that with the eleventh hour. Every year we we find ourselves in these situations, and I think the you know I I'm frustrated um, that we always find ourselves in that particular situation. And I'm not sure that spending that surplus is the right thing to do tonight, but it's going to be the thing we're going to do because we're running out of time. I think that the, you know, this this is sort of the downside to trying to, about focusing on the compliant budget because the compliant budget doesn't mean that we balance the budget revenue versus expenditures. It meant that we're within that, um, that uh, threshold that the ministry that gives us and it started to become practice. So anyway, I, I think that, as you say, Trustee McDonald, I think that that next year um, we start this process in September and, and I think that next week we may want to tie a motion to the to asking for or, or setting the expectation that through the budgeting process next year we want to make sure that we that that we're better than compliant we're balanced and maybe start thinking about how we get there so that the surplus, which will only be, which could only be a million dollars, um, is there to help us if we if we do get ourselves into a, an unfortunate jam. All right. Any other comments, Trustee McPherson? Um, I'm trying to figure out a word this answering the chair. We have underestimated our enrollment by roughly 118 students. Have we correspondingly underestimated our staffing? Because if you underestimate your revenue, have you adjusted the expenditure that is tied to that potential revenue? Like if those students show up, we're going to have a corresponding expense with them. So will that have a neg well, should have a zero effect upon our operating threshold approved deficit? Yeah. It's complicated. Well, I mean, I can answer it, but I'm sure you can too. But you know, it's complicated because the students don't necessarily, the addition of one student doesn't necessarily trigger the addition of another teacher. That's right, but it's, so it's, it's often hard, right? And that's what we're kind of banking on. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. The way we handled this, it was a bit of a, a roundabout nature. We calculated the revenue based on the projected enrollment provided by the planning department. We calculated our affordability for teacher staffing, and that's what was used to staff. We, if 100 students don't appear, we won't get the revenue for 100 students. But what we did was that $900,000 that you see is showing as an expense in our budget, but it isn't allocated in any way. It's a, it's a contingency in case we don't get that revenue. So two negatives make a positive. Through you, Chair. <coughs> Trustee Swan. <laughs> One thing I'd like to be reevaluated from the uh, budget is the American Public School Board Association because in all my three and a half years as a trustee, I've not seen one presentation from anybody who has attended uh, in, in the American Public School Board Association. I've seen some pictures on the internet and associated sites, but I've never seen anyone present to our board any benefit to our board. And that very much uh, worries me as to this could be funds that could be better spent within our ward. Okay. Well, I, I think that's out of line, Trustee uh, Swan. The accountability framework is is part of uh, is part of what comes out of that current messaging. I mean, if you want something um, to be presented all the time, I mean, we can we can talk about different things, but Mr. Chair, I think that that comment was out of line and. 
Mm -hmm. We don't evaluate the success of something based on a presentation only. I think that... Um, I'm sorry, I've seen pictures of you at restaurants and fishing trips and beautiful views in uh, America, but I've never seen anything presented in three and a half years to the board. All right. You know, Trustee Swan, I, I mean, I'm not sure what the what the intent of this is. If, if you're suggesting that nothing of value comes, I think there are better opportunities for you to raise that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we, we've, um, trustees take advantage of all kinds of professional development and it's well within the uh, rules, it's well within our policies, um, so I, I'm not sure what you're, what you're trying to achieve. Um, and certainly, um, you know, if you wish to have a further conversation, then, then uh, um, we'll find the appropriate time. Um, but um, just because you've uh, seen a couple of pictures uh, that doesn't mean that there wasn't value. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure what what. Due to inactivity is. in your conference, this call will be terminated unless. All right. Any other uh, comments or questions? All right. So, uh, Superintendent Barkley, are you? Um, you finished then, you've done your presentation. Still one more. Um, I think that gets us to the end of tonight's meeting. I don't think there's, yeah, we have uh, two motions um, that we recommend to the, uh, to the board. Pass the budget, so you wanna move that? Trustee McDonald, seconded by Trustee uh, McAllister. That the Committee as a whole recommend the Upper Canada District School Board approve the 2014-2015 annual projected operating expenses in the amount of $353,166,414 and capital uh, of $45,841,585 plus any additional amount subsequently allocated by the minister. minister. Uh, go ahead and call the question. Trustee, have the votes going here. Trustee Swan, I don't. Are you still there? Yes, just have to resign in. Okay. Trustee McPherson? I'm still here. Yep. Are you in favor? It still goes to the whole board, right? Eh? Well, not the big. Yeah, we're, uh, this is committed to the whole the board. Okay, Trustee Swan. Again. Opposed. Okay, so we have uh, Trustee McPherson who's abstained, uh, Trustee Swan who's opposed, uh, but the motion carries. All right, move on to the second motion, moved by Trustee McAllister, seconded by Trustee uh, Karkner, that the Upper Canada District School Board recommend the Upper, uh, that, sorry, that the Committee of the Whole Recommend that the Upper Canada District School Board authorize all transfers to and from the internally appropriated accumulated surplus as presented in Appendix G. Go ahead and Favor or opposed? Or? Yes. Against? Okay. Opposed? All 
All right, uh, with Trustee McPherson abstaining and Trustee Swan voting uh, against, and all others vote in favor, the motion passes. I have a motion to move um, back into the special board meeting. Trust. Before we do that, suggest something. Yep. We have been talking a lot about the, the accumulated surplus and how it should not be allowed to be traced. Would it be appropriate to uh, pass a motion to the effect asking um, your director, the superintendent, Marjorie, to return with a short term and long term strategy to that effect? I think we, we have, I think, yeah, we can do that tonight. We can also do it next week, but we don't have to do it tonight. We okay. can just go straight to board with it and just attach it to the board presentation. Okay, fine. Thank you. Just make sure that you give us some time to, to get the wording right on it and yeah. the, the expectations right. Okay, so do I have a mover and a seconder for moving back to the special board? Uh, Trustee McRae, Trustee Buckland. Go ahead and take the vote. Swan. I'm sorry, I can't see this on. I'm on it, but I can't see it. What am I voting for? Uh, moving back into the special board meeting. That's fine. Okay. Um, Associate Director, any comments? Yeah, cool. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for all the uh, the work and, and getting ready and and. Uh, Thanks for this, uh, those supporting members coming out and sitting with us. Um, certainly appreciate that, and I imagine your, your uh, superintendents and I appreciate it as well. Uh, thanks to the trustees, and we will see you in a week. Motion to adjourn, Trustee um, McMillan, Trustee.